Chapter 50 Shinri 9 In the end, after all of her waiting in the darkness, shamed by her fears, Avan never came to her bedchamber. Instead, he summoned her to his. It makes sense, Shinri thought ruefully, as her handmaidens quickly prepared her tala and hair. Why did I assume that he would go through the inconvenience of actually coming to my room? She stood stiffly as her women worked, surprised at her own fatalistic resolve. Not that she wasn't afraid. In fact, her heart beat with an almost buzzing intensity, and she could feel the sweat gathering on her brow and at the base of her neck. Outside the window, the evening darkness bespoke an ominous hour. He had finally ordered her to his bedchamber. She hadn't escaped, after all. She'd had chances to attempt an escape, not very good ones, admittedly, but opportunities nonetheless. Times when she could have ducked into an alley in the city or run from her pursuers, hoping to be lost in the crowd. Each one had seemed too dangerous, however. She saw the haunted fear in the eyes of the city men. All of the guards and soldiers had been mercilessly executed. Those who remained understood the monster that ruled Ral Aram, and she doubted they would help to hide her from his searchings. In addition, Shinri had never lived outside of noble accommodations. She suspected she would have nearly as difficult a time surviving on the city streets as she would in the wilderness. Wait for a better opportunity, she had told herself. You need to try and escape through the Oath Gates. Seek refuge with a foreign power, someone who can protect you. Unfortunately, there seemed to be few places of refuge remaining in the world. Alethkar invaded, Ral Aram captured, Prala in virtual ruins. How she wished she had taken King Amelin's suggestion that she stay with him in Thalana. Her meeting with the king seemed so distant now, as if it had occurred during a different epoch one where Shinri had been Yasna's ward, a simple girl doing another woman's errands. Shinri tensed her left hand, fingers gripping the knife hidden within her enveloping left sleeve. She was a woman now, by virtue of title or events, and had to decide upon her own actions. Perhaps she had made a mistake. Perhaps she should have tried to escape into the city, despite her reservations. Those opportunities were gone now, and events left her with only one certain determination. She would not let that man touch her again. The handmaidens finished their primpings. So soon? Shinri steeled herself, clenching her right hand to still its quiverings, and began to walk forward. She didn't move toward the door that connected her bedroom with that of the king but left in the direction of the main hallway. Avan had sent specific instructions for her to be seen leaving her rooms and entering his. The knife was a strangely calming weight in her hand. She had stolen it off of the men's table during a feast, swiping it from the place before an empty seat as she passed. She knew her intent to kill Avan was, from one viewpoint, ridiculous, a simple dinner knife wielded by an untrained woman would hardly provide a serious threat for the man who had killed Tal Shech Davar in a duel. However, she didn't really expect to succeed. Killing Avan was just one of the potential victories she could obtain this night. How would Avan respond to being threatened, perhaps even wounded, by his own wife? Would he kill her in retribution? If he did, he would suddenly find himself without a tangible link to House Davar. The two houses would be cast back to the same uncertainty they had faced that night so long ago, the night of the dueling competition. One man with an army, the other with a throne. Avan or her father would have to die, and either event would suit Shinri just fine. And if he doesn't kill you? Shinri thought with trepidation, as her ladies led her to the king's chamber door, which was opened by a steward. What if he leaves you alive? 
and just decides to punish you. That was an option for which she was also prepared. She would not live in such a situation. Either she would escape, or she would remove herself from his power in another way. Avon's rooms were oddly simple. They were adorned as one would expect for one of his position, but none of the furniture or art seemed to display any measure of personal taste. They were indicative of position without being showy, as if placed out of necessity rather than actual fondness. The only item that seemed even marginally original was a group of minstrels who sat at the far end of the sitting chamber, ready to act upon their master's call even at the late hour. Shinri's handmaidens led her to the bedroom chamber doors, and the steward knocked, then opened the door for Shinri. He and the others remained behind as Shinri stepped into the room. Avan stood consulting the map that hung predominantly on one wall. He looked over as she entered, his eyes flat, and waved for her to shut the door. She did so with a quiet hand. Kenor, Avan said. She is here. Shinri frowned slightly as a different door opened, and a man walked into the room. Of medium stature and perhaps in his sixth decade, the newcomer wore expensive but not lavish clothing, a fine and square-cut pair of trousers, a long white sen coat, and a loose blue sea silk shirt. Come here, woman, Avan ordered. Shinri did as commanded, gripping her knife uncertainly. This is Kenor Isava, Avan said with a direct tone. He is a physician. Soon your father and I will leave to deal with the remnants of the Aleph military. In a few weeks' time, you will inform your ladies that you believe yourself to be with child. Kenor has been assigned as palace physician. He will examine you and declare that you guessed correctly, then send a message to your father and myself, declaring the happy news. Do you understand? Yes, my lord, Shinri said. Good, Avan said. Two months later, assuming I have not returned, you will feign pains in your abdomen and send for Kenor. He will excuse all but his assistants from the room and attend to you. Afterward, he will sadly inform the palace that you have suffered a miscarriage. He will provide proof of the child's death, and you will substantiate anything he says. Do you understand? Yes, my lord, she said. In more ways than one. And why do you think I am doing this? Avan asked. The question caught her off guard. I am not sure, my lord she said, lowering her eyes. But I am just a simple woman. I will do as you command. Avan snorted derisively. Do not play with me, child, he snapped. You were trained by Yasna Kolin, and you have the spark of intelligence in your eyes. You think you can fool a man who was himself forced to feign stupidity for the better part of two decades? Shenry flushed, looking up. You fear that once my father has an heir, he will try to have you killed. However, if the Devar noblemen assume you aren't trying to make good on your promise of uniting the houses, they might not give you the support you need. So you have devised this plan to make it appear as if you have produced an heir, then lost it to chance. Very good, Avan said with a nod. Now, take off your clothing and throw it in the corner. Shinri froze, suddenly becoming tense. What? she demanded. Your women and my servants think that I am bedding you right now, Avan said. If you come out as pristine as when you entered, the facts will be obvious. So, go throw your clothing in the corner, mess up your hair and face paint. Then go sit on the bed and make the proper noises so those listening at the door will have gossip to spread. Kenor and I must confer. Shinri balked, only for a moment, but it was too long for him. 
Suddenly, his hand was at her chin, gripping her face between cool fingers and twisting her head up so her eyes met his. You forget the lessons you learned on our wedding day so quickly, he whispered. You will do as I command, child, both today and when it comes time to feign pregnancy. A clever woman can either be an asset or a grave hindrance, and I'm generally inclined to believe the latter. If I think, even for a moment, that you will betray me, then you will die. I would sooner kill you and your father than take my chances with the other Devar noblemen than have to worry whether or not you will obey me. Do you understand? Shinri gripped her knife. She could do it. She could raise her arm and plant it directly in his chest. But he's going to leave you alone. He'll humiliate you again, true. But he'll have to leave you in the palace when he leaves. He can't take the chance of having you with him on the battlefield, pretending to be pregnant, when your father and the other Devar noblemen are close enough to send their own physicians. Survive this night, and you won't have to wait in tension and fright. He'll be gone, and you can escape. Shinri lowered her eyes and nodded, shivering slightly. Good, Avan said, pointing toward the bed. Shinri followed his commands with as much dignity as she could gather, undoing her beautiful tala, then tossing it in a heap beside the bed. Avan watched the process with obvious lust in his eyes, smiling with a leering twist of the lips. He was so cold most of the time, but in this one thing he obviously had difficulty masking his emotions. Or were there any masks? Was this perhaps the only emotion he actually felt? Could a man really be that broken? Shinri paused, glancing down at her white sea silk undershift. He hadn't said to remove it as well, but he could probably argue that it should be wrinkled. She could feel his eyes and his smile. The room felt quiet, despite the physician's calm voice telling Avan of the drugs he would give Shinri to feign morning sickness and to stop her woman's issue. Avan watched. He was waiting. A test? I need him to believe, Shinri thought. Believe I'll do as he says, so he'll leave me here, alone. She removed her underclothing and wadded it up, dropping it in a pile. Then she sat on the bed quickly pulling the bedding up and wrapping it around her. To the side, she saw Avan's eyes linger on her for a moment. Then the physician drew his attention, and the king began speaking to the man in a low voice. Had she passed some sort of test? Or had she simply encouraged his lusting? Shinri sat miserably, trying to wash away the feeling of his eyes upon her. Avan said something to his companion speaking in a voice too quiet for Shinri to hear. The physician nodded in response, waving his hand to the side in a gesture of emphasis. As the hand flickered, Shinri thought she saw something beneath the cuff of his shirt, something coloring the back of his wrist. An Elinra tattoo. An Elinra brother? Shinri thought. Coincidence? Or is the king involved with them? Before, when gloating over his ability to see through her submissiveness, Avan had bragged of his ability to hide his intelligence for so long, and despite the reputation of idiocy he had founded, he had still managed to seize power. The event seemed near impossible, even for a brilliant man. If the Alinra were backing him, however, it all suddenly became more plausible. Shinri focused closing her eyes, trying to piece together what the king was saying to his companion. Noise, Avan suddenly said in a louder voice. Those outside expect to hear sounds from within, woman. I will not tell you again. Sighing softly to herself, Shinri did as ordered, destroying any chance she had of eavesdropping on the conversation. 
The knowledge that Avon had no intention of risking a child by her made Shinri's nights pass a little less tensely. Unfortunately, the days only grew worse. Avon had complete power over her, and he seemed to take amusement from expressing his control. He would order her to his rooms and have her sit naked on his bed while he worked on his maps and went over troop counts. He took her to social functions. Even in the midst of war preparations, the nobility felt the need for occasional mingling. At each of these meetings, Shinri was told to keep her eyes down, to remain at his side, and never speak without direct permission. Shinri saw discomfort and fear in the eyes of the other noblewomen. Avan employed no female scribes, he used monks in the open, and Elinra in private. Shinri heard little, since she was allowed minimal time for socializing, but her handmaidens reported some of the local gossip. The Vedan women were concerned with their king's behavior, primarily his treatment of Shinri. They whispered that he was dissatisfied with the power women held over Kanaran politics, and that he intended his treatment of Shinri to become the model. The Vedan were a people dependent on tradition. They would not be easy to change. However, the generals and noblemen watched Avan, and some of them displayed quiet approval. So it was that Shinri wasn't the only one who was relieved when Avan finally announced the army's departure. The declaration sent a wave of anxiety through the soldiers and their commanders, and for the first time, Shinri realized that, to many, the preparations might seem rushed. She had waited and prayed for Avan's departure, and each added day had seemed to drag like a winter high storm. However, Two weeks was not that long a time to move an entire army in through the Oath Gate and to organize it in the city below. Avan seemed to be waiting for something. Even after the army began to move down the slopes to the base of the Mount of Ancestors, Shinri saw Avan in frustrated conference with his generals. He often glanced northward, his eyes uncharacteristically troubled. He looked toward Kolinar. Was he worried about Dalinar, or was it something else? It was about that time that Shinri realized she hadn't seen the king's Shin henchman in quite some time. With a feeling of dread, she realized she knew where he might have been sent. Avan had focused a great deal of energy on capturing Ral Aram in secret, but someone had escaped, Lady Yasna. Shinri's anxiety returned tenfold. The Shin were said to be warriors of almost supernatural ability. If anyone could track Lady Yasna's escape, it would be such a man. If Shinri's guess was correct, this man had already slain a half ten set shard bearers, slaughtered children, and mercilessly advanced his master's domination of Vedanar. If such a creature had been sent to hunt Yasna, Shinri wouldn't let herself worry about such things. She had more pertinent problems, such as her own escape. She still had no idea how she would manage it. Perhaps expecting her plans, Avan had set a special guard over the oath gates. Ten men and one shard bearer stood guard at all times, and none of them made any move to join the departing army. Even with the withdrawal, the palace hallways were still well patrolled by soldiers, as were the ramps leading down to the city, not to mention the guards on the city walls themselves. Avan obviously felt it worth the cost of a few thousand troops to maintain a hold on Ral Aram, and he was probably right. Still, the preparations made Shinri's escape look less and less probable. However, she could do nothing before Avan's unyielding eyes. She needed to see him gone, sent to his unfortunate task with a surety of her submissiveness. So, when Avan finally declared that he himself was riding to battle, Shinri prepared herself in her finest dress and jewelry to bid him a properly triumphant farewell. 
Arvin's honor guard gathered on the palace plateau, along with several of the more important noblemen, including her father. When Ilhadal noticed her, his eyes didn't linger. He hadn't displayed indignation or even offense at Arvin's treatment of her. She had expected neither. In fact, from the way her father had treated her when she was growing up, Shinri suspected that he highly approved of Avan's new etiquette. Avan made his appearance in a suit of brilliant white shard plate. Shinri didn't recognize it. He had probably had the armorers paint and adorn it especially for the occasion. The helm bore a fan-like crest that came to several points, and the shoulder plates were draped with golden sea silk. The breastplate was embossed in the form of a magnificent Pal burst bearing the glyph Pell, the symbol for intelligence, the opposite of idiot. Avan was accompanied by two shard bearers who had, until just recently, been common guards. They had been awarded the only two blades captured during the taking of Ral Aram. Avan had made a great display of them, but Shinri heard whispers that the same number of blades had been lost to Yasna's escaping group. Avan made no speech, nor did he acknowledge her, though she was certain he would have been angered had she not been there with her ladies, kneeling on silken pads beside the palace entrance. He waved for his white charger and was moving to climb into the saddle when an approaching figure caught his attention. Shinri glanced up. A messenger in false aleph blue scrambled up the palace ramp, then made his way to Avan's side and voiced a message. Avan nodded once, waving for his entourage to halt their preparations. A few moments revealed the reason. A squad of horsemen, looking harried and fatigued in the afternoon light, clopped up the ramp. Shinri immediately recognized the man at their front. Avan's Shin assassin didn't have the same worn look as the rest of his group. The man rode with lithe dignity, slipping off his beast before it even came to a halt. He was to Avan's side like a pre-storm breeze, washing across the stones and bowing before his master. Shinri perked up. She was too far away to hear their exchange, but she had a good line of sight to Avan's face. Whatever the Shin man's message, it did not please the king. Shinri breathed in relief. Perhaps the man hadn't been sent after Yasna, but if he had, his mission had not found success. The Shin man stood, waving back toward his squad of men. The soldiers moved aside, revealing what Shinri had assumed to be pack horses. Settled atop them were two bodies, Several of the party's soldiers untied the bodies, and as one of them struggled lethargically, Shinri realized they were still alive. Captives, then, not corpses. One of the prisoners managed to stand on weak legs, and Shinri caught a shocking glimpse of the face. Even from a distance, she recognized Renarin Colin's muted features. The other one, tossed groggily to Avan's feet, proved to be the young peasant shard-bearer, Marin Colin. Probably not a shard-bearer anymore, Shinri thought ruefully, looking at the poor boy's condition. Her pity was immediately stamped out by another emotion, an irrational yet still potent anger. This was the man who had killed Tethran. It was foolish, and she realized that. Marin Colin wasn't really responsible for Tethryn's death. Avan had somehow ordered her fiancé to his doom, and Marin had acted justly to try and protect his king. Yet, looking down at Marin, Shinri was ashamed to feel a kind of twisted satisfaction at his fate. The boy didn't deserve her loathing, but he also didn't deserve to bear Tethryn's shard blade. Avan didn't lose his frown at the presented gifts, but he did seem placated slightly, as he should have been. If he intended to capture Alethkar, he would have to face Dalinar Colin at some point. 
the tyrant Bane's son and adopted ward would prove powerful bargaining gems, even against a man as noble and unyielding as Lord Dalinar. Avan waved for several of the soldiers to bear Renarin and Marin into the palace, while another man brought forth a shard blade and proffered it before his king. Tethryn's blade. Shinri felt a crawling chill as Avan reached out and accepted the blade, then shot a look in her direction. With an obvious motion, he summoned his own blade, then removed the opal and placed it in Tethryn's blade. The weapon immediately shifted, the strange awakened metal melting and reforming like molten steel until it was a copy of the king's former blade. Avan presented his own now discarded blade to another member of his honor guard, but Shinri wasn't paying attention. The thought of Avan's hand on Tethryn's blade. Better Marin bear it than him, she thought with a sick feeling. There was no reason for Avan to switch blades. Both would be identical when they bore his bonded opal. No reason at all, except to make one final display of his power over Shinri. He controlled her past, decided the fate of those she loved, and sought a grip on her very emotions. Shinri glanced to the side. The soldiers were dragging Marin and Renarin into the palace into the palace, to be kept in one of the secure cells in the west central wing. Avan knows that the palace is the most secure building in the city, the best place to keep a pair of important political prisoners. It was also the place closest to Shinri. Swallowing her guttural dislike of the boy who had taken Tethryn's life, Shinri forced herself to consider advantages and facts. Marin Colin was rumored to be a brilliant duelist. He had saved the king's life twice. And while Renarin wasn't the finest warrior in Alethkar, he had been trained in the great monasteries of Kolinar. And now, these two men were being held just a few hallways away from Shinri's own rooms. Avan had just delivered her a means of escape. Chapter 51 Jack 8 Jack's son, son Valano, truthless of Shinovar, felt a slight and discomforting surge of satisfaction at his failed mission. For the first time, Jack had been unable to fulfill his master's will. Not that he hadn't tried to locate the Lady Yasna. Jack's sense of honor was absolute. He could not sabotage his mission intentionally. He was required to use all of his facilities to serve his master's will, for that was what truth demanded. This time, however, no amount of competence had been enough to bring success. Perhaps the Lady Yasna had avoided Jack's scouts, or perhaps they had missed her by simple luck. More likely, she hadn't gone northward at all. Jack had done a fairly thorough search of the area, extending as far toward Crossguard as he dared, and his scouts had discovered no trace of her passing. Regardless, the woman was safe from Jack's blade. The satisfaction of guiltless failure gave him a brief smile as he rode beside his master, their horses marching at the head of the Vaden honor guard. Avan looked troubled, and he had a right to be. From all accounts, the Lady Yasna was a masterful tactician— she would waste little time bringing news of Ral Aram's fall to her brother. Avan's success was by no means guaranteed. Alethkar was wearied from war, true, but it was also armed with the spoils that came from a successful invasion. In addition, Avan's army didn't represent the entirety of Baden might. He only had command of those armies that Tal Shech had been able to raise. If King Elokar were warned in time, there was a chance he could escape Avan's offensive, withdrawing to gather support and leaving the Vaden forces exposed in the center of a hostile kingdom. Unfortunately, Jack had little practical knowledge of large-scale tactics. His clan was, 
or rather had been, the Nalan Thotath, a clan of the knife. His training was not in battlefield warring. While he had the practical leadership training of any Shin lord, basic command skills focusing on small squat leadership, his true focus had been in the arts of stealthy killing. The Nalan Thotath won wars by executing the enemy commanders, as honorable a method as any other in the eyes of the Shin. It had always amused Jack that the Easterners considered themselves too honorable to overtly use assassination as a practical method of warfare. Oddly, despite their sensibilities, the men who came into possession of Jack's bondstone seemed to have few qualms about using him to further their plans. Jack kept to his thoughts as Arvin's party left through Ral Aram's massive steel gates and began down the extended stone path leading toward the mountain's base. There was so much stone. Moving away from the cliffside as they were, Jack suddenly became aware of the oppressive mountain looming above. The troop of men wound its way down the ramp-like path, cliffs to either side, leaving the first capital behind on its ledge-like plateau sheltered in a massive rock crevasse. Was it any wonder that the Easterners didn't understand the sacredness of stone? There was so much of it here in the East that even Jack often found himself treating it as a mundane substance. He could almost forgive their heresies at times. Of course, at other times he felt overly sensitive to the desecrated rock around him, as if he feared losing his sense of truth and could only maintain a hold on it through exaggerated piousness. Could there even be piousness to one such as he? There is no truth in this world, Avin had claimed. The words had stayed with Jack all through his hunt for the Lady Yasna. What good was truth when it led Jack to commit atrocities? What good was honor when it gave a terrible man like Avin such a marvelous tool in a Shin assassin? Jack had considered similar questions beneath other Eastern masters, but never had a master pushed him as harshly as Avin did. Blood dripped from Jack's fingers even when they were clean. He knew that this very guilt was the purpose behind his punishment, a fitting judgment for one such as he. But had the Holotental really understood the extent to which these Easterners were willing to go? Several hours of riding didn't provide any answers. Jack spent them in silence, the air growing increasingly hot as they descended the mountain. Yet the heat was different here in the east. It was drier, especially in the summer. Here in the east, the searing was a dangerous time. Groundwater was tainted and undrinkable, and rivers were low even within lates. Jack glanced up at the sky and the angry sun overhead, glad that he wasn't a peasant living in one of the many remote Rosharan villages. Avan didn't seem to mind the heat. He rode quietly, his ease on horseback just another item on the list of his educational irregularities. The king must have learned to ride in the same place he learned to wield a shard blade and to perform a masterful oration. The quiet Ilinra brothers kept their distance from the idiot king, probably to keep suspicions to a minimum. Yet once Jack determined to watch for them, he easily began to pick out signs of Avan's silent companions. There were some soldiers who hung too close to the idiot king, some minor couriers who were given too much leeway in the workings of the court and army, some supposed stormkeepers who held conferences with Avan that even Jack could not attend. Each of these revealed an Ilinra tattoo on his shoulder or forearm. The marks were easy to miss and even easier to hide, but Jack was trained to see that which others overlooked. Most people wouldn't have made the connection. Ilinra were growing more common amongst even the upper class, especially in Vedanar, and the tattoos were hardly irregular. However, after what Jack had seen in the temple of Nail Ilin, he could not ignore the coincidence. As for the other things he had seen, well, he was not yet convinced. The children had acted like onyx seers, true, but it was not so difficult a thing to mimic descriptions from records or stories. 
Besides, the alternative was almost too unsettling to consider. Avin was an evil enough force on his own. If he were backed by the Hulkaltop, the powers called Epelian in the East, then he would present a danger such as Roshar had rarely known. As nightfall loomed, Avin's caravan approached his aggregated armies. The group was gathered in a secure valley and was well camouflaged for a force so large. Even Jack's keen eyes had trouble discerning its presence from a distance. Of course, no amount of hiding would keep their secret if Lady Yasna reached Crossguard. And she wasn't the only danger. A passing merchant train, the eyes of a wandering peasant, any number of passing coincidences could doom Ovin's expedition. You were right, Jack said. You need to move quickly. The armies are committed. Any more hesitance could doom the invasion. Avon looked up, eyeing Jack. The words were the first either had spoken during the five-hour ride. Lord Devar still thinks we're moving too hastily, the idiot king noted. He wanted to hold Ral Aram and gather strength, forcing Elokar to come to us. Jack shook his head. The first rule of assassination is surprise, he said. He turned, meeting Avon's eyes. And that is exactly what you are doing trying to assassinate an entire army. Avon cocked his head, then smiled deeply at the analogy. Well put, he said, kicking his horse forward. Jack followed, guiding his horse down a short incline toward the army's sheltered hiding place. There were some fifty thousand men in the force, a considerable number, though they were forced to travel without archer towers. Avon kept a ten set of awakeners to provide food and water for the men, and there were an impressive sixty shard-bearers in the troop. From the latest reports, King Elokar would be hard-pressed to provide three-fourths their numbers, even if the battle for Crossguard had gone well. Avon's pavilion lay in the nobleman's quarter of the camp, and he rode toward it with a reaffirmed regal air, daring show no fatigue despite the extended ride. Soldiers paused in their chores as the king passed, their eyes showing excited realization. Avon's arrival marked the end of waiting. The king wouldn't have left the safety of Ral Aram unless he intended to attack. The captains wouldn't give the order to disassemble the camp until the following morning, but only the dull-minded or unobservant would be caught surprised. They reached the royal pavilion, and Jack climbed off his horse, annoyed at the slight soreness he still felt after his extended ride searching for Lady Yasna. No shin man should suffer from going horseback. His people raised and trained most of the beasts ridden here in the east. Yet forced to serve another's will as he was, Jack often didn't have time for daily riding exercises. He either spent his days in continuous riding to fulfill some assassination order, or he spent them cramped within one blasphemous stone room or another. There was no moderation. Jack stretched, then followed Avon and the king's bodyguards into the royal tent. Someone was waiting for them. Jack reached the intruder first, of course. He snapped across the pavilion's rug, drawing his yanakatakat before the guards even realized the room was occupied. Jack positioned himself between the intruder and Avon, reflexively moving to protect the man who was his enslaver and had his long-bladed knife at the intruder's neck within three heartbeats. The old man did not flinch. He sat pleasantly in Avon's chair as if unconcerned about the blade pressed against his skin. Avon regarded the intruder with curious eyes that showed only a shade of worry. He pushed back the tent flap, waving for one of the door guards to enter. Did you let this man in? he asked the soldier. The guard paled. My lord, no, we let no one pass. Avon nodded, waving the soldier away. The king turned back toward the intruder, his expression growing even more intrigued. The intruder said nothing. Jack held his knife still, his muscles tense. There was something strange about the intruder, something subtly unnatural about the way the man had remained motionless as Jack struck. In appearance, the intruder was mostly unremarkable. 
He was irregularly straight-backed for his age, and his silver hair was full and well-groomed. His wrinkled skin was aged, but his body wasn't decrepit. He looked more stately than he did elderly. I feel like I should recognize you, old man, Avon noted carefully. We have never met, Avon Vedenel, the intruder said, the movements of his jaw pressing his neck against Jack's blade and drawing blood. Though I have watched you for some time, taking Alethkar is a bold move, one I had always hoped you would attempt. Avon stood thoughtfully for a moment, studying the intruder before finally adopting a confused expression. You're the old Aleth King's stormkeeper, he said, the one called Balan Mar. The intruder, Balan Mar, nodded slightly, though Jack's knife kept the motion to a minimum. Where is the Lady Yasna? Avon asked, taking a step forward. I hear that she escaped into the caves beneath the city, Balanmar said. She was always a clever child. You did not go with her, Avon asked. No. Then how did you escape my soldiers? The intruder simply smiled. You are an interesting man, Avon Vedenel, he said. Whether you are clever or foolhardy, I have yet to determine. Either way, I have decided that I can be of use to you, so I have come to offer my services as an advisor. Avon snorted. You expect me to trust a man who so easily betrays his homeland in favor of its invader? Balanmar shrugged. Trust? No. I don't expect your trust. But do you trust the would-be king who fights at your side, a man barely quelled by the prospect of a grandson on the throne? How about the Shin assassin who holds his knife so diligently at my throat, a man who would betray you without thought if you happen to misplace his bondstone? Do you really trust anyone around you, Avon Vedenel? What is trust to a man like you? True, Avon admitted. But each of those you describe, trustworthy or not, brings me an edge I could not otherwise obtain. You, however, have a very poor record as an advisor. King Nola Norin lies in the catacombs of Rel Aram dead at the hand of his best friend, and his son is about to fall to my armies. Your advice seems to have been of little productive use, Balanmar snorted. I'm an informant, not a bodyguard, he said. Besides, neither man, son or father, had keen enough ears for my suggestions. If they had listened, perhaps they would still live. Don't make their same mistake. Jack could tell, however, that Avon was no longer paying attention. The king's eyes had moved away from the captive man's lips, and he was thinking carefully to himself. Would Avon execute the old man, torture him, or simply hold him for later purposes? Jack thought he knew which Avon would choose. The idiot king was not fond of loose ends or of men who knew too much about him. I can give you your snakolin, Balanmar said idly. Jack glanced toward Avon and saw that the king had noticed the words. There are only a few exits from those caverns, Balanmar continued. They all open out onto the eastern side of the mountain. Too far from Crossguard to be of use to King Elakar, but dangerously close to Kolinar. What do you think, Arvin Vedenel? Can your armies face both Elokar and Dalinar at once? Elokar might be a fool, but his reckless temper should not be underestimated. How would your army fare against Elokar's ferocity if the calm rock of the tyrant bane were pressing you from the east? You can tell my men how to get through the caverns, Arvin asked. 
Bring in a scribe, Balinmar said. I'll give precise directions. Avon didn't move immediately. Eventually, the lure proved too great, and he waved for a soldier to relay the message. Then the king nodded to Jack, who slowly lowered the blade from the old man's neck. Balinmar smiled pleasantly, pulling out a handkerchief and carefully wiping the trickle of blood from his neck. What do you ask in return for this knowledge? Avin asked, eyes still suspicious. Nothing you aren't already willing to give, Balinmar said. Be more specific, Avin ordered. Balinmar's affable smile didn't leave his eyes as he spoke. Just make certain your men kill Lady Yasna and her companions on sight. None of them must survive. Chapter 52 Dalinar 4 High storm clouds bulged in the distance. It had only been twenty days since the last storm, but it seemed like so much longer. The late's plants drooped in the constant sunlight, many retreating within their shells. What had been green just a week before was now withered and wan. The great Kolinar River had slowed to practically a trickle. The effects of the searing were strong here, even in the most fertile area of Alethkar. But a high storm was coming at last. And it was no ordinary storm. This was the Almighty's bellow, most powerful and impressive storm of the year. It would bring both life and destruction. Outside the late and the less sheltered farmlands, all spring crops would have long been harvested. Most people would be tucked within safe granite homes. Those too poor to afford good stone houses would wait in the village storm shelter. No man, beggar, thief, or traveler would be abandoned to the bellows' fury. In the late, less concern was necessary. Yet even here they had to be cautious— the bellows' power would be dulled by the steep valley walls, but not rendered impotent. Wise men remained indoors. Dalinar stayed on his balcony watching the storm approach. During recent weeks it seemed he had little reason to call himself wise. He knew not how Marin and Renarin had managed to elude his trackers, but he was only mildly surprised at the feat. Both boys had often proven themselves too clever for their own good. Dalinar kept his men searching, but he had little hope that he would discover them before they arrived at their destination. Even riding at a moderate pace, two unencumbered men would have been able to reach Crossguard in two weeks' time. All of Kolinar knew of the disappearance, of course. Most people had even guessed at the boy's destination. What had been a scandal when Arador left had since become a catastrophe. Dalinar's men reported a feeling of unrest in the town. The bar rooms were full of questions wondering who would be heir, and postulations on whether or not Dalinar would have the honor to disinherit both of his sons. Even quieter were the grumbles that claimed the boys were right, that it was wrong to wait like women when the rest of the kingdom fought. Dalinar had lost his courage, they whispered. The tyrant Bane no longer had the will to fight. And they were right. Dalinar knew they were. His neutrality was a weak move, an indication of uncertainty. The old Dalinar would never have done such a thing. He would have made a decision, then followed it with tenacity, no matter what the consequences. That was honor, holding to one's word and being willing to give it in the first place. Instead, he waited. Without the oath gates, and with the river being too low to carry boats, information from the east was scarce. The battle would have started days ago. Men probably fought and died even as Dalinar stared at the approaching clouds. Or perhaps the fighting was over. Elokar would have had to strike quickly to counteract the grumblings of his allies, who were already fatigued from several years at war. Dalinar gritted his teeth, fingers gripping his balcony's stone rail. He needed information. In the past, he had been one of the first to receive battlefield news. 
This time, however, he had placed himself in a tangential position. Since he had chosen to support neither combatant, neither would see any urgency in keeping him informed. That left him with his own messengers sent to gather what they could. These were few, however. Arador Renarin and Marin's pilferings, combined with the horses Dalinar had been required to give their pursuers, had left his stables depleted of its best stock. The storm was near. It was even darker than most, and its approach was like the shadow of night. Dalinar thought he could feel it nearing, the air cooling as if in frightened worry, the breeze curling with anticipatory winds while his cultured Voran senses reminded him that there was nothing mystical in the storms, he couldn't help shivering slightly as the bellow approached. Its unnatural blackness, its expected rage, its inevitability. A rider appeared on the late ridge. The man sped down the switchbacks at a reckless pace, his cloak flapping with familiar blue. The land darkened behind him, water beginning to pour down the rocky slopes. In the distance, Dalinar could hear a low roar, the surging Kolinar River swelling in its banks as sudden and furious waters fed its long-dried thirst. The rider reached the base of the slope as the rains overtook him, obscuring Dalinar's view. A moment later, darkness took the palace and a wave of wind-driven rains smashed into Dalinar. He tightened his grip on the rail, squinting his eyes in the powerful tempest. All was dark. He felt his cloak writhing and whipping behind him. Chill water bit his skin, instantly soaking his clothing. He could hear nothing beyond the incessant slam of raindrops against stone. He took one rain-laced breath, then fled into his rooms, throwing his weight against the storm shutters and closing them behind him. Compared to the chaos outside, even the rattling shutters and background roar of the rain seemed peaceful. Dalinar wiped his face, dripping water onto the sitting-room rugs. Kalkana would have been furious. Kane would only see them cleaned and dried, offering neither complaint nor reprimand. Dalinar stood for a moment, thinking about the messenger. The man's news was probably inconsequential. It was unlikely that he was a rider from Crossguard. He was probably just one of Renarin's pursuers returning to give further word of defeat— or perhaps he was just a rider from one of the outer tribute cities come to make a report. Yet why would such a man have risked the bellow? Why ride with such direct zeal rather than stopping for shelter? A quiet, worried impression told Dalinar to seek refuge from the news as he had fled the storm winds. There was something very wrong about the messenger's arrival. Dalinar quietly changed his clothing, then walked through hushed hallways toward his audience chamber. Servants and minor attendants watched him, yet none moved to speak or interrupt. He arrived at the hall and seated himself in his chair. All was still. Then the audience doors burst open. The messenger stood haggard and wet. My lord, he gasped, apparently surprised to find Dalinar already waiting in the chamber. He fell to one knee, though he looked so wearied he could barely maintain the posture. Speak, Dalinar said. My lord, the man said, trailing off, a look of despair in his eyes. He was one of the men Dalinar had sent to Crossguard. The messenger looked up, gathering strength, but Dalinar knew the words before they were spoken. My lord, the messenger said, your son, Arador Colin, is dead. Dalinar didn't react. He didn't yell out his grief, cry out in pain, or even close his eyes in mourning. How? Oh, Dalinar asked, surprised at the stiff strength in his voice. Executed, my lord, the messenger said, by the king, along with Lord Jezenrush and his sons. Crossguard fell eight days ago, the walls destroyed by awakeners. The king himself led the charge inside. Renarin? Dalinar asked. No word, my lord, the messenger said, looking down. But... Dalinar nodded. The boy had no shard blade. There was a good chance that, if killed, Renarin would be ignored amongst the bodies. A small group of noblemen was gathering behind the messenger, just outside the audience hall. Dalinar saw confusion and shock. And with those emotions he saw something else. 
something Delinar felt burning within his own breast, something stronger than fatigue, surprise, or even logic. Anger. Delinar stood. The noblemen outside stopped their whispering and waited with expectant eyes. Lord Achathan, Delinar said, still amazed that his voice could sound so solid and determined when within pain squirmed and wept. You made an offer to me the first day of your arrival a week ago. The firm-faced man stepped to the front of the group and nodded. I remember, Lord Dalinar. Gather your allies and mine, Dalinar commanded. Prepare them for war. Tell them. Tell them that the tyrant Bane is needed again. Chapter 53 Yasna Twelve. Their inn had its own storm shelter, and Meridas appropriated it for Yasna himself and the other noblemen, including, much to his obvious regret, Talm and Brother Lon. By Yasna's order, Meridas had grudgingly consented to let the innkeeper, his family, and several other high ranked citizens share the space as well. Not that there wasn't enough of it. The inn storm shelter was broad and looked to be of unworked stone. The building had probably been built in this location to monopolize on a natural cavern. The shelter obviously doubled as a cellar for the inn, and it was cluttered with boxes of wine bottles and other provisions. Even with such, however, there was plenty of room enough that Yasna felt guilty for letting Meridas insist that the other refugees be housed in the city's common shelter, which was undoubtedly crowded with travelers. Still, the shelter's emptiness did make for comfort. Yasna sat in a chair brought down from above and had situated it near one of the room's four lanterns, ostensibly so she could study a book she had borrowed from the monastery. She was too nervous to read, however. She told herself that it had nothing to do with superstition, that she didn't give any heed to the stories of storm shades or other creatures that were supposed to stalk the land during this, the grandest high storm of the year. Yet she felt an eerie sense of foreboding as she sat in the dark, cave-like shelter. She could barely hear the tempest's fury overhead only the occasional noise of distant-sounding winds, mingled with the sound of a leak dripping lethargically, gave clue of what occurred above. Somehow the sounds seemed all the more haunting for their unobtrusiveness. Yasna wasn't the only one in the room who appeared a bit fidgety. Theirs was an impatient group. They planned to begin their march northward as soon as the bellow ended giving them a full twenty days of travel before the threat of another high storm. It made sense to wait out the bellow in Markabe, but Talm had finished preparing their provisions early the previous day, and they had only needed to wait a little longer for their clothing to be finished. They could have left long before had the bellow not been imminent. Instead, they waited. Talm's warnings of pursuit tickling their minds, mingling with thoughts of an invading army sneaking cleverly through the oath gates, slowly approaching the weakened Aleph armies. Yasna sighed. For the moment, her mind should be focused on their travel to Kolinar. Water would be tight, but Talm was confident they could make it. Without horses to worry about missing footing on the uneven ground, they could travel mostly at night and conserve liquids. He did suggest, however, that they remain close enough to the Aleph border that they could seek out a village in case of an emergency. The madman himself sat near the far wall, looking over his list of provisions. Meridas stood chuckling with his young nobleman adjuncts, who were becoming more and more comfortable with the idea that a Parshan was paying them favor. They probably realized that he only did so because there was no one better, but their nobleman's instincts wouldn't let them pass up the opportunity to pander. Only one man didn't seem even slightly nervous about their impending flight. 
Brother Lon sat with his back to the stone wall, using only a single cushion for comfort. He noticed her regarding him and smiled, rising and strolling over to her chair, then seating himself on the stone floor beside it. Lady Yasna, he said, his affability seeming strange within the dank confines of the storm shelter. Brother Lon, she replied, I just wanted to say that I appreciate the new boots, he said, smiling down at the pair she had purchased for him out of the group's funds. I dare say they are the finest present I've received from a heretic in my entire life. Yasna raised an eyebrow at his lack of decorum. She suspected that Tom's favor of the man came, in part, because they were both incurably blunt with their opinions. Lon smiled happily. You seem to accept my supposed heresy without much concern, Yasna noted dryly. Supposed, Lady Yasna? Lon asked. I believe I've read one of the essays you wrote during your days at the new house. Any man who only supposes that you reject Voronism might as well climb out into the bellow and suppose that he'll get wet. Yasna frowned. You won't persuade me to change my views, monk, she said. More zealous men than yourself have worked on me to little avail. Oh, I'm not working on you, my lady, Lon assured. I'm just trying to amuse myself. How relieving, she answered, turning away from the short monk, glancing over at Talm again. The madman was staring at the wall across from him, his eyes lost to memories and his own thoughts. He sees things and remembers things that scare him, Lon said in a quiet voice. Yasna glanced away from Tom, looking back down toward the monk. What kind of things? Lon shook his head. He won't tell me. I don't think he really ever confronts them himself. I think, maybe, they are why he acts like he does. Insane? Lon frowned. I don't know. He's not like other madmen I've known, Lady Yasna. Perhaps he's not really mad at all. You believe him? Yasna asked incredulously. Believe is a strong word, my lady, Lon said. Do I think he's some sort of deity? No, I don't believe that. But what are these heralds that we worship, really? Beings sent by the Almighty. Creatures whose purposes are to protect and to warn. Throughout lore, the Elins have cared for mankind, going where the Almighty cannot, lest his tenfold perfection destroy the flawed world around him. The heralds have been heroes and sages, bringing peace when possible and leading war when inevitable. I wonder, is this a path we should dissuade a man from emulating? He doesn't try to emulate, Lon, Yasna said. He thinks he is one of them. Lon shrugged. If the end result is the man who sits on the stone over there, then I think that we could be far worse treated. Yasna paused, then spoke in a more hushed tone. It's not that simple, Lon. You were there that evening of the duels. You saw his eyes. You know how he can get. She waited, her silence prompting him to grudgingly nod his head. Yes, I saw. He frightened me that day. Yasna said. Frightened me more than perhaps I should admit. Now that I have seen him fight, I'm frightened even more. I saw him kill two shard bearers in the space of three heartbeats, Lon. I saw him slaughter nearly a ten set of men with casual grace. Mix that with what I've seen in his eyes, the uncertainty, the instability. What will happen then, Lon? Will anyone in this group be able to stop him? Lon shifted uncomfortably, and Yasna felt shame at her words. 
She wanted to tell herself that Tom would never do something that horrible, yet she couldn't be certain. At times he seemed so stable, so stalwartly wise. Then he would mention one of the other heralds, if only in passing, and she would remember that glint in his eyes. Could anyone truly trust such a man? Yasna shivered as she looked at Tom. She sensed something else from him, something unrelated to wisdom or madness. At times, when he stared off like he did at the moment, he didn't seem like soldier, lunatic, or herald. He just seemed lonely, alone, like Yasna felt when she would admit the emotion to herself. Is there nothing you can do for him? She asked quietly. My lady, Lon said seriously, one of the first things I learned at Peace Home was that there was little I could do to help anyone. At best, I can know when to listen and know when to speak, when to comfort and when to annoy. Even if I were better at such things, I don't know if anyone could understand how to help Tom. He's a special case. With normal madmen, there's little to do in the way of curing, but you can help them understand how to fit themselves into regular society. With Tom, I don't think that's necessary. He understands society. In fact, he seems rather adept at finding his place and doing well by it. I don't know what to tell you. Perhaps he will confront what he hides and will realize that he doesn't need to be a herald to protect those around him. Or perhaps he will continue on as he is, using the crutch of madness to keep from facing those images that haunt him. That decision, unfortunately, is left to him, or more appropriately, to whether or not his mind is capable of recognizing it as a decision at all. Lan let the words hang between them, and a moment later, Yasna realized that the sounds of wind above had ceased. Sure enough, a pounding came on the door a few moments later, followed by a voice telling them that the bellow had passed. Remnants of rock buds formed the bulk of the refuse. Broken shells, limp stalks torn from their purchase, and mashed leaves lay scattered across the village. The fragments must have been carried with the storm for miles, for the hills immediately surrounding Marcabe had been cleared for farming. Mixed with the scattered pieces of foliage, of course, were other scraps that showed a human touch pieces of storm shutters, strips of leather, and even fragments of worked stone were littered about, most laying morosely in vast pools of crom clouded water. Village peasants moved through the wreckage, picking through the broken scraps for anything worthy of salvage. Yasna had seen far worse. Ral Aram lay exposed to high storms on the side of the mountain face, even its mighty walls and clever positioning didn't make up for the lack of a late valley, and many of its houses were lavish with expensive woods and rugs. If such a home's storm shutters broke, the bellow found a plenitude of delicate items upon which to expend its wrath. Here, in Marcabe, few of the buildings seemed to have suffered any serious damage, Though a couple of older homes had finally given in to the elements, stone walls or roofs collapsing upon themselves. Hopefully the occupants had been smart enough to realize the danger and had spent the bellow inside the common storm shelter. Well, Talm asked, climbing up the storm shelter steps and pausing beside her. Yasna nodded. Let's be going then. Gather our things. Talon waved for Kemnar and his soldiers, then ducked inside the inn to gather their packs. Yasna stood waiting. Her new clothing felt uncomfortable, unnatural. She wore pants divided for a masculine stride, like trousers, though they maintained some semblance of femininity by remaining relatively loose and flowing. 
she wore a sen coat instead of a cloak. The garment, essentially a cloak with sleeves, was far more practical than her delicate feminine cloaks. It was sturdy, barely embroidered, and designed to be easily tied closed in case of a storm or chill, which would be common since they were to travel mostly at night. Beneath the sen coat and tucked into her pants, her shirt was barely distinguishable from that of a man. She had four other outfits similar to it. They weren't indecent. Such clothing had been worn by Canaran women for centuries in places such as Lachanran and even Yakaved. However, Alith Carr was far more conservative. For an Alith noblewoman, especially one so closely related to the king to wear such things, well, it probably wouldn't be quite a scandal, but it would certainly earn her some gossip in the court. No one from court can see you, Yasna reminded herself. Still, she wished she had given in to Meridas's clothing suggestions, as opposed to Talm's. Even after she had made the decision to walk, Meridas had suggested more traditional clothing, while Talm had pushed for brutal practicality. He displayed such as he left the inn, a large pack on his back. He dropped a similar pack beside her, and she didn't even have to ask to realize that he expected her to carry it. Hers was far smaller than his, true, but she had assumed that agreeing to walk would be enough. Still, she didn't argue. She stood quietly, expecting someone else to make her objection for her, and he did. Surely you jest, Meridas asked pointedly. Yasna turned with a smile, then was surprised to see that Meridas wasn't looking at her, but at the large pack Talon was holding out for him to carry. If you want to drink or eat on this trip, Talon said, you'll need to carry some food. We're going too far with too little expectation of relief to let anyone go without helping. Meridas sneered at the pack, but accepted it. Despite her own frustrations, Yasna was amused to think how out of place his rich clothing would look with the utilitarian brown pack strapped on his back. Meridas's two attendants received their own packs without complaint, now that their master had acceded to the necessity. Talm looked over their small group, nodding to himself. Then he gathered up a set of captured spears and began distributing them, one per person, even to those who were already wearing weapons. You'll appreciate them as walking staves, if nothing else, Talm said before anyone could object. And we might have need of them. All right, we ready to go? Of course not, Meridas said. We have to wait for the others. Talm froze. Others? he asked. There are no others. Indeed there are, Meridas said. Lady Yasna ordered me to gather them. Do you not remember? What? Yasna demanded, speaking even before Talm could voice his own question. Surely you remember, my lady, Meridas said smoothly. This was an argument he had been anticipating. It was while you were deciding on new garments, two days before. You told me that if I wished, I could bring men to help in Lord Elokar's war efforts. I was talking about Tenin and Chathan, Yasna said. Ah, Meridas said. You did not make that clear. I'm afraid I may have done something rash in promising the others they could join us then. Yasna opened her mouth to ask but closed it as they began to arrive. Men, both young and old, gathered around the inn. Ten set upon ten set of them came, all bearing a weapon of some sort, spears both crude and fine, axes for the wealthiest, cudgels for the poorest. They wore their own packs, but most looked laughable compared to Talm's well-planned, carefully organized supplies. I apologize, my lady, Meridas said as the men continued to arrive. 
I gave them my oath and that of the king, trusting on what you had said to me. I promised them that they could join us in liberating Alethkar from our enemies. Tarn stepped up beside her, his face hard with anger. What? Yasna asked quietly, so only he could hear. What is he doing? There must be nearly a hundred men here. I thought it was decided we were to travel by stealth. He never wanted to, Tarn said. He wanted to go straight north. He'd intentionally sabotage us for the sake of his pride? Yasna asked. Tarn shook his head. No, this is about something greater. This is about power, not just pride. Before, the only soldiers in the group were your guards. Merdas just changed that. He's made himself an army. A short distance away, Meridas smiled as he regarded his troops. Some of them were from the original refugee group, but many were from the village. Think, Lady Yasna, he declared, and I believe you shall see this is for the best. Why ride to our king's warning with just a couple of soldiers when we could bring a hundred men instead? And of our need for haste, Yasna demanded. They are young, able men. Meridas said, and there really aren't so many of them to be bulky. We can move as quickly as before. Besides, we have sent messengers. And our pursuers, Tom demanded. Meridas raised an eyebrow. If you recall, madman, most of us still disbelieve that pursuit comes as quickly as your paranoia indicates. We're a good four weeks' march from Rao Aram. We will be gone long before enemies arrive. And if they send horsemen, we now have the numbers to resist them. If they send shard bearers, well, we'll distract them and you can just attack them from behind with your usual flair. Tom sighed, turning to Yasna. We can't take them. Leaving them would make an oath breaker of Meridas, Yasna said. And by association myself, since he acts on my orders. Oaths and intricacies of honor are not reasons to risk a kingdom's safety, Tom said. You don't care about the kingdom, Yasna reminded. You just want to get to the holy city. True, Tom said. But I'd rather get there alive. You think this fluff will be of help? Yasna glanced at the troops, then at Meridas, and felt a sudden swelling of shame. Meridas should never have been able to surprise her this way. What is wrong with you lately? She thought angrily at herself. Ever since the attack on Ral Aram, you've been missing things, important things. There was time to ponder her deficiencies later. At the moment, she needed to make a decision. Honor or no, she could order Meridas to leave the men behind. The good of Alethkar came first. Yet Yasna hesitated to disperse the men. She studied them, and she was impressed by the resolve she saw in their eyes. They were a ragtag mix, true, but they had honor. These men might have avoided military service during the Prelir campaign or Elokar's attack on Crossguard, but now that an enemy had invaded, they came willing to serve. They had heard of the slaughter at Ral Aram, and they knew, as she did, that this was one war they could fight, confident that their side was in the right. Could she deny them the opportunity to serve? Meridas does have a point, Yasna said to Tom. These men will be of use when we reach my brother. He will need fresh troops. They're untrained, Tom pointed out. Most rural men in Alethkar are at least marginally skilled in the spear and formations, Yasna said. Weren't you supposed to have set up that little suggestion several centuries back? Tom gave her a thin-eyed look, then regarded the troop of would-be soldiers. This is ridiculous, he said. We'll have traded one group for another nearly as large. We'll have traded the weak, young, wounded, and female for potential soldiers, 
Yasna said, growing more confident in her decision. You're actually going to consider this? Yasna nodded. One word from Meridas's earlier comments stuck in her mind. Paranoid. Was Talm really imagining this pursuit he supposedly heard in the caverns beneath Ral Aram? He continually spoke of the coming of the storm shades, warning that all of Roshar was in danger of destruction. She wanted to trust his judgment, but that look in his eyes at the duels, when he had faced her, when she had thought, for just a moment, he would grab a weapon and cut down every person in the room, nobleman, servant, and noblewoman alike. When the truth surfaced, she knew she would rather have a hundred armed men at her back and face Talm's pursuit, then pass up the soldiers. Perhaps she had spent too long at war in Prala, or maybe it was the suspicious distrustful nature that Elokar seemed so fond of claiming she had. Either way, she made her decision. We'll take them, she said. Talm held her eyes, but he did not glare. Finally, he nodded. We can't leave for several more hours, then. We'll need to spend some of your horse money to buy pushcarts and supplies for all these men. It was dark by the time they left Markabe. That wasn't a problem in itself. The dwelling was high in the sky during the summer months, and the intense collection of stars provided fine light for marching. As the first hours of the march progressed, Yasna took a serious look at herself. She had decided to bring the hundred men, but she was still angry at herself for letting Meridas maneuver her into the position of having to decide. She simply didn't give the man enough credit, and that would have to stop. Unfortunately, her underestimation of Meridas was a sign of a greater problem. Ever since she'd left the palace comforts behind, she'd had trouble controlling her surroundings. As she trudged along beneath the starlit sky, Yasna was forced to admit her deficiencies. She had commanded armies. She was a master of tactics, both on the battlefield and in the political court. Yet she had never done this before. She had never been forced to walk across stone hills beside regular men. Even during the Prelir campaign, her place had been one of comfort. She commanded the court, true, but she was also dependent upon it. With everything she knew removed, she found herself grasping toward whatever flimsy reminders she could devise. Meridas's offer of pretty clothing had tempted her not because of its luxury, but because of what that luxury represented. Comfort, familiarity, and control. You will have to do better, Yasna. You can't depend on what you knew before. You have to learn to work in a different environment now. The first thing she had to do was remind herself that Meridas wasn't just a fop. He was a dangerous enemy. She had to remember the cool hate she had felt on that night of the dueling competition as she knelt over Nell Shendon's corpse. With that thought firmly in mind, she was able to notice things she should have seen earlier and recognize the extent of her mistakes. The hundred villagers marched around her, but they were not her men. They belonged to Meridas. In the city, she had assumed that since she had Meridas's oath, she would have control of the soldiers as well. She had misjudged. Always before, when she had been allowed to meddle in military affairs, she had done so at her brother's indulgence. Meridas intended to give her no such leeway, and he had both tradition and law on his side. The command of fighting men was a masculine art. As long as their group had been made up of refugees, a female could claim leadership. As soon as it became a military expedition, however, her authority found its end. Scouts did not report to her. Great consideration was given to her comfort, but Meridas's two noblemen lieutenants felt no need to ask her opinion or consent for their actions. She could command Meridas, of course, but she could only do so in private, 
and he could easily conceal information from her with excuses. As the evening march progressed, Yasna realized that she had work to do. Meridas could not be allowed to remain in control. Somehow she would have to retake command of the group. Unfortunately, the march soon revealed a second, even more humiliating mistake in her reasoning. She had been wrong to assume she could easily maintain a quicker speed. Meridas set a fervent pace, and the men followed without complaint. Some of the older citizens had served in the military in their youth, and even those who weren't accustomed to military discipline had spent their lives working in fields and doing other kinds of manual labor. She would have thought Meridas himself to be plush from his life as a merchant, but that was obviously another error. He seemed completely unfazed by the strenuous pace. The pain in her feet grew worse, and aches from their previous march returned with vengeful anger. Until the escape from Ral Aram, she had been carried almost everywhere she went, and it was discomforting to discover just how unprepared she was for an extended hike. Soon, she was sweating despite the cool air, and she felt pains in her chest and side. Tom's pack was heavy on her back, as if he had filled it with stones just to spite her. She wouldn't complain, however. She wouldn't call for them to slow their pace just to appease her weakness. Tal'n's words from before had stung more than he probably knew. Are you so charmed by your own arrogant grandeur that you would risk the safety of your kingdom in exchange for a little comfort? She had acted no differently than any noblewoman would, but apparently that wasn't good enough for him. Well, he would get no further pleasure from mocking her weakness. She would keep up. She would continue placing step after step, forcing herself to keep moving until Meridas called halt, or she collapsed. It will grow easier, a voice said beside her. You may not realize it, but our hike to Markabe strengthened you. Your body is still unaccustomed to extended movement, but it will grow stronger. Today and tomorrow will be the worst. Yasna glanced to the side, not bothering to mask her spite. Tom marched with apparent ease. No sweat marred his brow despite his enormous pack, and his step even had a bit of a spring to it. Of course he's happy, she thought. Meridas may have recruited himself an army, but we're still moving toward Tom's goal. He doesn't care about Aleth Carr. He simply wants to feed his delusions. As long as we continue toward the ruins of the holy city, he will be happy. Tal'n eyed her, smiled slightly, but didn't say anything. What? Yasna demanded, raising a hand to wipe her brow. No mocking words? Or is the sight of me walking along like this enough of an amusement on its own? You're tired, Tal'n said, and that has made you irritable. Try and take your mind off of your misery. And perhaps you'd like to tell me what to think of instead, she snapped. Tal nodded toward the front of the line. Well, we could decide exactly what we're going to do about him. Meridas and his attendants marched at the head of the group, their silhouettes distinguished by their broad nobleman's cloaks. When they had begun the night's trip, Yasna had been near the front, but she noticed with chagrin that she was now trailing the main body by a short distance. There was little formality to their march, no neat lines, just men in clusters, talking and joking with each other. It was amazing to Yasna that they could be so light-hearted when the pace left her gasping. Meridas had organized the troops into ten-man squads and rotated scouting duties between them for now, until he determined which men were more proficient at the duty than others. The teams also traded turns pulling Tom's four supply carts, which rolled and bumped across the uneven ground. They had left behind the farmlands, moving once again into rolling hills, growing with rock buds and other wild foliage. 
creeping rosh tree vines, engorged with water from the bellow, curled in shadowed places, alongside larger boulders or crevices. Craters, with their four arrow-shaped leaves, clung to stone surfaces. Most were dead and dry. They would only begin growing again with the steady fall high storms. Something bothered her about the scene. Meridas seemed too comfortable. True, he had been in the Prelier War with Elokar and was no stranger to troops or even leadership. However, a court dandy shouldn't know how to organize and command troops. Moreover, he shouldn't know how to carry himself as he did, like a man to be followed, a strong commander of soldiers. He's done this before, Yasna decided. It wasn't that his foppish mannerisms were a show. She suspected that he really was exactly as he presented himself. There were just more sides to the man than she'd first assumed. He wasn't simply a merchant who had talked his way into her brother's graces. He was a clever man, with a background and experience, just like any other. What do you think we should do about him? Yasna said, trying to overcome her physical pains and focus on the dialogue. Well, Tom said, first I suggest that you and I stop squabbling. Yasna eyed him. A truce, she asked. An alliance, he corrected. One not born of forced oaths, Yasna, but of simple honesty. I respect your opinion and your right to lead these men. In turn, all I ask is that you respect my desire to reach Jorovan. Yasna shifted her pack from one uncomfortable position to another, studying the man who walked beside her. What did he owe her, really? What did she even know about him? I want to reach the holy city, Tom said, but I have no intention of breaking my oath at this time. I want to see this people cared for and trained, the same that you do. You can trust me, Yasna. I will not betray you. She felt a desire, almost a need, to trust him. And, to an extent, she thought she could. There was a piece of him that could never be trusted, however. The madness. We'll worry about that later, she decided. For the moment, Meridas was a far more pressing problem. Very well, she said. Let's work together. Good, Tom said, nodding forward again. What do you know of him, particularly of his life before he came to court? Not much, Yasna said with a sigh. I looked into his background, of course once my brother started paying attention to him. Meridas's recent record as a merchant is well known. He was active in Alethkar for about a decade before he came to the capital. Before that, well, I know that he came from a fifth city in southeastern Alethkar, where he was of a lesser noble line. I could find no close living relatives, however. Nothing about his childhood? Tom asked or where he got his military experience? Yasna shook her head. What I could discover didn't lead me to believe he had any military experience. That's obviously not true, Tom said, studying the man's form up ahead. I know, Yasna said. I noticed the same thing, but he could have learned these skills during the war in Prala. He spent a lot of time with my brother, though Meridas himself was never given any major commands. Also, most noble boys, no matter what their rank, receive training in the arts of military leadership. Perhaps, Tom said doubtfully. Kemnar said that Meridas dueled well at the competitions. He dueled very well, Yasna said. Or at least, he did the one time he decided to fight, when he wanted to humiliate Lord Dalinar's heir but I've met ten sets of traveling dandies who can sword fight with the finest of soldiers. That doesn't mean they're much use in real war, once you remove the formalities and conveniences of the dueling ring. I don't know, Tom. He carries himself well, but maybe he's just good at mimicking what he sees in others. Tom nodded. 
Some things, however, cannot be faked. Kemnor also told me Meridas had an opal to place in Glifting, once the king granted it to him. Why did he choose my blade from the pile? I don't know, Yasna said. Because he wanted to spite you? No. He and I had no rivalry then. He chose my blade because it was a soldier's weapon. It was weighted the best and formed the best for practical use. He saw that, even if he did so unconsciously, and selected it. Yasna sighed. She didn't mention that she had been there when Talm lost his blade. The weapon's opal had been newly placed, still clear, which meant its imprinted form would have belonged to the man who owned it before Talm. Talm, however, would never admit that. Talm was still studying Meridas. This man has been oft underestimated, he decided, and he encourages such misunderstandings. Yasna nodded. Our first task should be to keep him from gaining absolute control of these men. I realize you don't approve of my decision to bring them, but that is past us now. It's going to be a very long march to Kolinar if we let Meridas remain in control. Agreed, Talm said. However, Yasna continued, it's going to be difficult to do anything about his leadership. Meridas is the ranking nobleman of the group, and he was the one who organized the men in the first place. Talm paused, frowning slightly. He told them of our departure, true. But I don't know that he is the only reason they decided to join us. He nodded forward again, and Yasna noticed occasional glances from the men up ahead. Glances backward. The few close to Yasna and Talm seemed to be trying to watch the madman without actually looking at him. Suddenly, Yasna remembered the stories, the whispers, and the stir that Talm had caused in Markabe. The initial refugee group had regarded Talm with almost worshipful reverence, though Yasna had attributed the sentiment to his saving their lives. If, however, they had passed their feelings on to the people of Markabe, Talm was right. The stories of his rescues in Ral Aram mixed with the common man's superstitious nature, would have persuaded many to wonder if indeed he was a herald, despite Yasna and Meridas's insistences otherwise. These men had not come simply because Meridas had asked. They had come at least partially because they hoped to see proof of Talm's possible divinity. Offer to train them, Yasna said. See if they'll spar with you. I'll order Meridas to let you provide them with lessons. He won't have any grounds to object, since the men obviously need instruction, if they're to be of any use to my brother. Tal nodded. A good suggestion. As I spar with them, well, we'll see where their loyalties truly lie. Over the next few days, Tal proved annoyingly correct about her fatigue. The first few days of marching were by far the worst she had experienced yet, but the pain and fatigue did begin to decrease by the third day. Meridas made no formal objection to Talm's training of the soldiers, though he did argue with Yasna in private, claiming that Talm would taint the men with his madness. Though Yasna worried about the same thing, she remained firm in her command. Not only did Talm's training undermine Meridas, but she soon realized that, whatever its motivations, the lessons made quick and vast improvements in their troop quality. Though she had spent little time on battlefields themselves, she suspected she knew more about troops, fighting, and combat units than any other noblewoman. Meridas might have some unexplained military experience in his background, but it was soon obvious that Talm himself was the far better commander. The men obeyed Meridas, but he treated them with the same terse arrogance that he used with all of his inferiors. Even after just three training sessions, each performed at the end of a day's march, Yasna could see 
that the men had grown to respect Tom far more than they ever would Meridas. Meridas spoke to them as a nobleman commander. Tom spoke to them as a fellow soldier. On their third day out of Marcabe, a second, smaller group of men approached in the distance. There turned out to be forty of them, men of Marcabe who had decided belatedly that they didn't want to miss out on the chance to accompany Tom and Meridas on their quest to save Alethkar. Tom easily folded the newcomers into the main body of troops, giving only a passing comment to Yasna that they would have to be certain to watch for settlements with which to trade, since the influx of men would drain their supplies. They crossed the border into Remax sometime during the fourth day. When they stopped for their midnight meal, one final group from Marcabe caught up with them. This one contained only twenty men, and Yasna was surprised when Kemnar was the one who went out to meet them. He returned with a short, wiry peasant man, and both walked directly toward Yasna. What is this? Yasna said, rousing from her seat, a Shena blanket thrown over a small boulder. My lady, Kemnar said, resting a hand on the man's shoulder. This is fourth citizen Nachen, owner of the damp stone, the finest tavern in Marcabe. Citizen Nachen. Yasna said as the man bowed. Before we left, Kemnar continued, I mentioned to Nachen that someone might come looking for a group fitting our description. He was kind enough to keep watch for me. Yasna frowned. She had given Kemnar no such command. However, since you're here, citizen, Yasna said, I assume that Kemnar's prediction was well founded? Yes. My lady, Natchen said. They arrived a day and a half after the bellow. Five of them, all on horses. Lords, I suspect, though they weren't dressed in finery. They wore glyphs that proclaimed them to be of King Elokar's army and said they were messengers on an important task. They fooled the rest of the town, but I lived in Vadenar during my youth. My elder brother married a Vaden merchant's daughter and I recognize a Vaden accent, even a subtle one. Besides, those men were too tall to be Aleths, and they seemed too blunt to be noblemen trained in one of our courts. Yasna raised an eyebrow, surprised at the man's knowledge. What did they say? Nothing overt, my lady, Nachin said. They kept to the bars, asking too many questions, listening a little too well, being a bit too free with their chips kind of like Lord Kemnar here did the first night he came to town. Kemnar blushed at this, but Natchen continued. Anyway, it was obvious who they were after. They asked too much about your ladyship and the Herald. They rode off that very night, heading back the way they came. Yasna frowned. It appeared that at least one of Tom's suspicions was no delusion. King Arvin was searching for them and his soldiers had just found the proper trail. Go and make the same report to Lord Meridas, she told the innkeeper. But leave out Lord Kemnar's part in it. Say you decided to warn us on your own. Yes, my lady, Natchen bowed again, then paused, looking back. I didn't believe you at first, my lady. I thought you were a fool for trying to pass your man off as another herald pretender. Well, if there are Vadens on our soil, the other things you said might be true too. That's why I brought my cousins and sons with me. We won't see our homeland taken by their like, no indeed. Yasna blinked in surprise as the man bowed again, then moved off to obey her command. What was that? she demanded of Kemnar. He thought, I endorsed Tom's lunacy? Kemnar shrugged. You travel with him, and you obviously trust his judgment. I don't trust his judgment, she snapped. He's insane. Kemnar just shrugged again. Yasna sighed. Well, answer this then. How did that man know where to find us? 
We told the villagers we were heading straight north. At this, Kemnar flushed slightly. I told him, he said. I thought it better to risk having an informant behind, just in case. If no pursuit came, then I'd betrayed nothing. If it did come, then I figured we'd rather know for sure that we were being followed, even if it risked giving away our location. You didn't come to me with such postulations, Kemnar, Yasna said angrily. You're the one who's been telling me that I should be independent, now that I have a blade, he said. Besides, you wouldn't have let me tell him, no matter how trustworthy a man he was. And I would have been right, Yasna said. What if he'd led them straight to us? Kemnar shook his head. You have to trust people sometimes, my lady. I did, Yasna thought. I trusted my brother, and look where that got me. She shouldn't have told Kemnar their path. She should have let everyone, including Meridas, think they were going north. Except, this time, Kemnar had been right. You have to trust people sometimes. Who? The madman who thought himself a demigod? The oily man who thought to own both her bed and her brother? The servant who was no longer a servant? A man who thought so little of her judgment that he simply avoided asking questions that he knew she'd answer in a way he didn't like? No. Trust was not something she would easily give again. Yet, she no longer had a heart to chastise Kemnor. He was right. He had to make his own decisions now. He had entered the game. He was a player now, no longer a pawn. He had to learn that. And so did she. Chapter 54 Marin 12 Arador was dead. Marin had seen men die before. Despite superior equipment and training, the Aleth spearmen had hardly been immune to danger. Arrows had claimed their share, and prolen spears an equal portion. Heavy infantrymen with maces and hammers had occasionally wreaked havoc on Marin's line, and, even more rarely, his companions had faced the terrifying blade of the shard-bearer. He had lost squadmates, even friends, to that near-unstoppable force. But Arador's death was different. Arador was something more. He had been so confident and so capable. Everyone knew Arador was one of the best duelists in Alethkar. Marin had seen his performances both on the practice field and while fighting the assassins that night of the dueling competition. Arador represented nobility, the new nobility, the truth that Marin had learned it to be. Not distant or ponderous, but affable and helpful. Arador had bespoken a simple honor which went beyond words read by monks or scribes, a goodness even the stories hadn't quite been able to capture. Arador was, he was like Lord Dalinar. Such men weren't supposed to be mortal. Marin shivered slightly, leaning against the corner of his cell, the flats of two different walls scraping his back. The room was bare, without furniture or even blankets. The guards had only given him a rusting chamber pot and a small bowl to hold his meals. The room was barely tall enough for him to stand, and he could cross from one side to the other in five paces. He hadn't been given any opportunity to explain himself. The guards who brought his food never spoke to him. King Elokar obviously felt no need to demand information from his captives. He just wanted Marin to suffer. And Renarin, too, Marin thought sickly. If I was going to get myself into this, I could have at least left poor Renarin behind. He had heard nothing of a younger Colin. Marin couldn't tell if there were any other cells in the hallway, but if there were, Renarin hadn't answered to his calls. Marin shivered again, pulling his cloak close. At least they had let him keep that. His cloak, Lord Dalinar's cloak. Lord Dalinar, who had just lost his second of three sons. Did he know yet? How would he react? He'll fight, Marin thought. 
He'll have to. How could the king do such a thing, putting his cousin's head upon a spear like that? Arador saved the king's life that night. It... I could barely duel a blind man. Arador defeated those shard-bearers, and now he's dead. Hopefully Arador had died in battle. Even King Elokar couldn't have been cruel enough to execute his own cousin. But... Jezenrosh was the king's cousin, too, and the king had risen against him. Arador had believed the king was wrong, had believed it strongly enough to disobey his father's commands. What was it he had said the day of his departure? There's something very convenient about the way those assassins struck, giving the king a perfect opportunity to move against Crossguard. Could a man be so eager for war that he would exaggerate an attempt on his own life? Arador's desiccated head, lit by uncertain torches, was an image not easily forgotten. Even if the king hadn't gone to war under false causes, then he had at least been responsible for Arador's death and desecration. This was the man Marin supposedly served, the man the ballads and the way of kings said was supposed to be the most honorable man in the realm. He was also the man whose life Marin had helped save on two separate occasions. It didn't make sense. Why would the Almighty preserve King Elokar's life under such remarkable circumstances, only to let him act the tyrant upon his own people? What of Marin's supposed heroism? His great deed, the salvation of the king and earning of his shard blade, suddenly seemed tainted. Marin's nobility was linked to that of the king. If Elokar was unworthy of his station, then that transformed Marin's act from one of holy bravery into something more like random misfortune. The questions bothered him so much that he actually asked his guards to bring him a monk, so he could demand to know why the Almighty would preserve one man just so that he could murder a much better one. The guards, of course, ignored the request. They only came to bring food, and even that happened far less often than Marin would have liked. In fact, it appeared that his cell was completely unguarded. His small barred window provided an empty view of a blank hallway. It was lit only by the sunlight that must have come in through an unseen window. The days passed in painful lethargy. The room was maddeningly small. The closed-in walls, with no sight of the sky, made him frantic at times. His head still hurt from the blow he had taken, and Ardor's death weighed upon him mixing with his grief for Lord Dalinar, who probably thought Renarin dead too. It was nearly too much. As his worries loomed, Marin began to fear for his sanity. He was rescued by an unlikely source. It happened by accident during a moment of particular desperation. Logically, Marin knew the walls of his cell were made of immobile stone, and yet... He could see them creeping forward, sliding toward him. Rather than snapping, however, he found himself seeking refuge in the now familiar stances Vasher had taught him. Strangely, the forms brought him a measure of peace to combat the frustrations of captivity. He had learned long ago, as a young spearman, that focus was the first skill a warrior should learn. The man who could focus on the battlefield, remembering his training despite arrows, screams, and enemy spears, was usually the man who lived. Vasher had expanded upon this training, forcing Marin to focus on his stances and styles until he knew their moves as part of himself. It appeared that within this focus the sounds and dangers of battle weren't the only things that could be ignored. It allowed him to push back the walls, breathe deeply despite his enclosure, and keep himself strong. The forms didn't help with his grief, but at least he didn't have to fight depression and claustrophobia at the same time. Either one alone was more than bad enough. Marin stared at his finger, focusing on the double images in front of him. Slowly he let one eye become dominant, and one of his finger images became clear then invisible. He smoothly switched his attention to the other eye, letting one image of his finger fade away while the other one reappeared. He couldn't make both disappear at once yet, but he was getting close. A few more days of meditation, and he would have it. A few more days. Before his captivity, he would have groaned at the thought of such forced meditation. 
Now, however, he knew that he needed to fill his time and his mind, lest he think too hard about his small enclosure. And so, when his body tired of the dueling forms, he moved on to the little meditation exercise Vasher had taught him. Marin had heard that monks spent long hours in meditation, pondering philosophy, or sometimes thinking about nothing at all, instead just letting their minds be clear. Perhaps Vasher had gotten this particular exercise from some form of monastic training. Whatever the original source, Marin was grateful for it. It wasn't performing its original function. Marin was beginning to doubt he would ever return to Kolinar to learn to skep, whatever that was. However, the meditative exercise was serving a far more vital purpose. It was keeping Marin sane. Sane for what? He still wasn't sure. The cut of stone in the walls told him he was probably being held in Rel Aram. Either King Elokar would order Marin executed for treason, or he would order Marin released to Lord Dalinar, who in turn would undoubtedly strip Marin of rank and blade. After all, that was what Marin had earned through his disobedience. Marin paused, letting his eyes focus and lowering his finger. Had he imagined that sound? A small stone from the wall directly in front of him suddenly popped free and fell to the floor with a crack. Marin stared at it for a dumbfounded second, then looked up. There you are, said a muffled yet familiar voice. I thought the rock would never wiggle free. How are you holding up? Renarin, Marin said, jumping to his feet in an enthusiastic motion. The hole was in the back wall, the one opposite the door. Renarin, where are you? I'm in a cell, of course, Renarin replied. Much like yours, I suspect. I would have spoken to you earlier, but I've been busy. Busy, Marin said, rubbing his fingers along the hole's sides, trying to expand it. There were a few cracks in the wall here, where the stones had settled over time, but none of the others seemed loose. Busy how? You said you're in a cell. Renarin didn't respond. Renarin? Marin said, a bit frantic. Yes, a distracted voice said a moment later. I'm glad you're all right, Marin, but I do need to get back to my work. Blessed winds, Marin thought. He's snapped, like I almost did. Renarin, how can you talk like that? Marin said. How can you be so calm after what happened to Arador? I knew Arador was dead before we left Kolinar, the voice responded. Or, well, I knew he was dead without actually knowing it. Anyway, I was ready for what we found. We have to think of other things now, other works. The ones who control this palace could very well capture all of Alethkar unless we find a way to help. Marin paused. Those who control the palace? he asked. Renarin, what are you talking about? No response. Renarin? Marin asked a little more loudly. Who controls the palace? The Vedans, Renarin eventually said. That's right. You were still unconscious. They kept hitting you to keep you down. Men fear shardbearers even when they are unarmed. Those weren't Aleths who took us, Marin. They were too big, too... Vaden. Anyway, they've taken the Oath Gates. I saw their army as we rode up into the city. It was big. Marin stepped back, blinking in surprise. The Vadens? Invading Alethkar? With the Aleth armies weakened from fighting one another. Even to his untrained strategic senses, that sounded very bad. We might be able to do something, Renarin was saying through the hole. I'm not sure yet. I've still got so much work to do. Us? Marin asked with a sinking feeling. Renarin, we're locked in cells. Besides, without my blade, what am I? Even with it, I couldn't help Arador. Throughout my time in Kolinar, I kept wondering what my place was. I could never find it. Maybe that's because I didn't have a place. I wasn't supposed to be there. Possibly true, Renarin said. Possibly untrue. I really don't know yet. But you were the one who convinced me to go try and save Arador, and we knew that was a hopeless battle. What reason do we have to give up now when things are remarkably less predictable? Less predictable? 
Marin asked. Renarin, we're locked in a dungeon. And unless you know of a couple more loose stones, we're probably going to be here for a while. You might want to look for more stones, Renarin said. Rel Aram is well built, but sometimes we forget how old it is. The Oath Pact kings built it in the sixth epic. That makes the palace a good two thousand years old. Still, I doubt you'll be able to pry your way out. Some chipped rocks in a dividing wall are one thing, but a potential escape route? Well, don't hope too much. Now, if you'll excuse me. Excuse you, Marin said. What is so pressing? Work, Renarin said distractedly. Work? Marin asked. What work? There was no response. Marin nearly screamed in frustration, not wanting to go back to the lone silence. Renarin, he said, grasping for anything. Renarin, I'm sorry your sphere got destroyed. At first he assumed there would be no response. Then, blessedly, Renarin's voice returned, though much weaker this time. Destroyed? Renarin asked. Oh, I broke that on purpose. On purpose? Marin asked with surprise. Of course, Renarin said. How else was I going to get a shard of stone small enough to slip past our captors? Oh, and I grabbed this for you. There was a slight scraping sound. Marin peeked through the hole between their cells as Renarin pushed something through, forcing it forward with his soup spoon. Marin reached out to catch the object just as it plopped free from the wall. It was a shiny black opal. Marin's opal from his shard blade. Marin stood in stunned amazement for a full ten heartbeats. Renarin, he said with a joyful cry. Where? How? Right after I broke the onyx sphere, Renarin said. I pretended to stumble, then grabbed your opal off the ground. There were so many pieces of black rock on the stone then that they didn't notice one missing, even if it was a bit larger. I figured you would want it. Marin closed his fingers around the smooth stone. He almost felt like he had been given a piece of himself back, a sane, hopeful piece. As long as he had his opal, he could restore his blade, if he ever managed to get another one. Thank you, Renarin, he said through the hole. There was, however, no response. Whatever weirdness Renarin was about, it had claimed his attention again. Chapter 55 Taln 10 All was not right. The return had begun, over three months lost already. The other heralds had not contacted him. Ral Aram was held by invaders, while the epic kingdoms, the few that remained, squabbled amongst themselves. Something was wrong with his Nael bond, and the powers it granted had failed him. Yet standing before troops again, making soldiers out of common men, this was something Taln understood. There was a comforting familiarity to it. He had quickly updated his knowledge of modern strategies by speaking with Kemnar and the other soldiers. The use of mobile towers was a newer invention, developed as bow technology, historically useless against the crystal-boned Chothen, came into favor. Awakeners, thankfully, were rarely used in battle. Tan well remembered the chaos of the Awakener Wars of the Third Epic, wars the heralds themselves had sparked to overthrow Kanar. Modern battles revolved around shard blades, as Tan would have projected. Versatile formations of men organized by armament formed the landscape upon which shard bearers dueled. The formations of men weren't unimportant, of course. They were used to gain position and strategic dominance on the battlefield. The shard-bearers, however, were the focus of the battles themselves. So, the first thing Tom taught his men was not to be frightened of a shard-blade. His teachings bothered Meridas, and that was all the more reason to continue them. The nobleman shot troubled glares toward the soldiers as Tom allowed each one to hold his blade and take a few swings, hopefully dispelling some of the mysticism surrounding the weapons. Tom showed them the delicate art of parrying a shard blade, teaching them to slap the weapon on the flat of its blade, 
deflecting it without letting one's spear haft touch the sharpened edge. He forced them to face him, one man at a time, and spar with him until they learned to focus less on the weapon and more on their opponent. Even Kemnar, who was normally so accepting, found this training a little unnerving. Shard blades, weapons forged to protect mankind from a demonic threat, were coveted and revered. It troubled the noblemen to see their mythological aura dispelled. Talm did not stop his training. Demystifying shard blades was only a small step. In seven months, these men would have to face the Chothan themselves. Even during the days of the epic kingdoms, when men had believed in the storm shades and been trained to fight them, Talm had seen many a brave man frozen by fear when faced by a legendary demonic horror. And so he trained them not for Yasna's war, but for the one that would come afterward. He taught them discipline, then explained why it would save their lives more often than would any spear or shield. With the increased numbers from Markabe, they were nearly two hundred strong. Not an army, but a reasonable task force. Their weapons were poor in quality, their armor non-existent, but their will was strong, and Talm saw that their training was good. By the time a week had passed, he had them marching with discipline, and Meridas was able to increase his pace from the leisurely march he had kept during the first few days. Talm could see the effect the increased speed had on Yasna. She was shorter than most of the men in the group, and was unaccustomed to walking with a natural stride. Her life had been one of ease, at least physically, and her body protested at the strain of forced marching. Yet he knew she would endure. There was warrior's determination in her eyes. Not all battles were fought with spear and sword, and though her life had left her physically weak, it had given her a will as strong as that of any general. He didn't patronize her, saying little of her travails. Her body would accustom itself to the exercise, and she would be stronger for it. In the months to follow, she would need a body as tough as her mind to survive Chothan invasions. The one who surprised him most was Brother Lan. The plump monk joined in the battle training with the other men, though Talm had never suggested he do so. In fact, Talm had expected Lan to have as much trouble as Yasna. If the monk felt the pains of extended walking, followed by intense spear training, he didn't show it. In fact, he continued to work even after the training, for each night, or rather morning since they slept during the day, he gave a recitation from the arguments. He quoted flawlessly, despite his claims, that he had never had the patience for memorization. Tone could see the appreciation in his soldiers' eyes. Meridas gave them legitimacy, Talm gave them skill, but Lon gave them faith. Kemnar, would you take over for me? Talm asked. The bald warrior nodded, and Talm clapped him on the shoulder before leaving the sparring area. Morning was approaching, almost time for the men to bed down, and a light was pooling on the horizon. The soldiers continued their practice around him, Kemnar taking charge as Talm left. There was little for him to do, however. The squad commanders saw that their men performed the proper exercises and formation practices. Kemnar simply had to walk among them, being seen inspecting the practice. Several things were evident from the landscape around them. The first was the undeniable fact that Remak, cradle of Vornism and most noble of the epic kingdoms, had fallen. The roads, once the kingdom's pride, had fallen into disuse, or perhaps disuse was an understatement. The few scattered trails they passed were so weathered it was difficult to tell if they had really once been roads or if their apparitional lines were simply tricks of the eye. Everything was overgrown with rock buds and weathered by high storm floods. The occasional stone bridges they passed were worn and often broken, and rubbled remains of villages and towns were regularly reported by the scouts. However, scattered among the shadows of what had once been, one could find the facts of what now existed. Remak, or the area it had once covered, was not as empty as Tuln had been led to believe. Frightened, defensive villages, farmed Inava among the hills, 
their buildings huddled and weathered by cromstone, as if they were trying to mask their presence from outsiders. Meridas sent men to trade with these when possible, and the reception they received was cold at best. Still, Yasna's gems were valued commodities, as they would allow for trade across Alethkar's border. Tuln worried at the necessity of exposing themselves, but knew that there was little he could do. The trompings of several hundred feet left broken rock buds and trampled foliage. If the men who chased them were able to discern their initial direction, finding their trail once they passed out of the barren Inava fields would not be a problem. Town simply had to count on their head start and the enemy's hopeful lack of horses to keep his men away from their pursuers. He sighed, ladling a precious bit of water to his lips as his men trained in their formations. They shouldn't have to worry about pursuit. Men should not fight men. They had a much more dangerous foe to consider. Men would give parley. The Hothen only sought death. Even the slaughter at Ral Aram's palace would be tame by comparison to what the Stormshades would do if they caught the people unaware. But thinking about the infantile quarrels of men, even for the hundredth time, would not change the situation. He dropped the ladle, noting how low their water stores were. Fortunately, the high storms would begin again in about a week. Of course, those would bring their own problems. He found Lady Yasna sitting beneath her canopy. Little more than four sticks with an awning, it was nonetheless the closest thing they had to a tent. She sat on her blanket, massaging her feet, but stiffened and stopped as soon as she noticed Taln. He had to smile at her appearance. Despite their extended march, despite the hardships she suffered, Lady Yasna forced herself to maintain the proprieties of a perfect Aleth noblewoman. She insisted upon enough water to wipe herself clean at the end of each day, and she kept her hair immaculately braided despite her lack of serving women. In fact, her bearing was still that of the calm commanding noblewoman. The only clues to her predicament lay in her humble clothing and the slight tan her fair skin had begun to adopt. As usual, she wore no gemstones, no rings, no hair jewels, not even a pendant. It was so striking an irregularity that Tone was surprised he hadn't made the connection to her awakening powers long before she revealed them. Tone waved away the pair of guards who stood guarding the lady's tent. They glanced at Yasna for confirmation, which she hesitantly gave. These men, at least, were loyal only to her. That was good. Tone squatted down as the men left, seating himself on a short boulder beside her blanket. Yasna stared up at him with a cool expression. It probably angered her that he should see her weak, but he was of little mind to put up with feminine stubbornness, so he ignored the glare. He reached into his cloak pocket and removed a small bag. From this he dumped a small pile of gemstones. She paled just slightly. What are those? Tone raised an eyebrow. Yasna rolled her eyes. Yes, she said dryly. I know they're gemstones. What are they for? You know that too, he said calmly. The funds you gave me were mostly sapphires and emeralds. I had to do a great deal of searching in Markabe to find a good sampling of each pole stone. Yasna glanced down, eyes drawn to the gemstones despite her obvious distaste. Yes, she had the look of an awakener. He should have seen it, the way her eyes lingered on the stones, the way she obviously had to force her hands to remain in her lap. She had Kemnar handle all of her funds so she would never have to touch currency, and never wore gemstones, all so she could try and pretend that she wasn't an awakener. He remembered that call. It wasn't an easy lure to resist, especially at first. In fact, though he had long since overcome the call himself, a piece of Tuln felt dead whenever he touched gemstones this return. Where they had once sung, they were now strangely silent to him, just as they had been to him before the creation of his Nael bond. He gritted his teeth against the memories of awakening, focusing on Yasna. You have to learn, he told her. 
She looked away from the stones, regarding him with hostile, angry eyes. We have had this discussion. Your abilities are a gift from the Almighty, Tom said sternly. He would not have given them to you if he didn't wish you to use them. The Almighty, Yasna snorted. You'll need a better argument than that, Taln. Very well, then, Taln said. What of your people? What of duty to your kingdom? With leather I could make armor for these soldiers. With steel and awakeners fire I could forge better weapons. With the power of awakening we could carry a simple pouch of zircons and emeralds rather than lug four pull carts full of water and grain. This is a military expedition, and so far you have been useless to it. Meridos provides leadership and I give the men training, but you are only a liability, especially since you refuse to make use of the one invaluable ability you could provide. Yasna recoiled, her face growing even more icy. You speak to me of duty? You who care nothing for this expedition or its people save that it takes you closer to the holy city? You, who would have left Ral Aram without even a fight, sneaking away from the invaders without giving warning? Yes, Lan told me of your plans that day, when you knew of the attack and were preparing to run. One wonders why you even got involved. Did you go to the invaders to see if, perhaps, they might make a more powerful ally? After all, what are kingdoms and deaths to you? You've lived three thousand years. Considering all that experience you've supposedly had, one would think that you'd be leading the armies of man, not traipsing along with a half-equipped band of untrained soldiers, having abandoned the first capital to invaders. If you really are one of the ten heralds, then I do hope the other nine are more competent than yourself. Otherwise, it's a wonder mankind hasn't been destroyed already. The other nine? How could she know? How did she see what he was, the least of ten, surely an embarrassment to the others? Who was he, a simple soldier, to be chosen to join them? Kings, men of great wisdom, brave heroes and masterful knights, all of them, all of them except Taln, Taln the footman, Taln who should never have been made one of them. Taln, who had doubted their course, the capture of the Magnata, the formation of the Nile Bond. Memories buried beneath three millennia surfaced, bright and hot as when they had first been imprinted. The other heralds must be working to save Roshar, for if it were up to Taln, mankind was doomed. If it had been up to him, mankind would have been destroyed long ago. The flames came again the first time since the dueling competition. The canopy disappeared in an explosion of burning strips of cloth. The sky overhead bubbled with fire and all was red around him. The stones melted to lava, his flesh curled black, and the howling began. Horrid, chilling screams. The screams of a thing that should be dead but could not die. It appeared from the burning whiteness a creature wreathed in darkness, a pitiful yet horrifying monstrosity. And it came for him. He stood to face it, hand groping for his shard blade. Taln! Her voice was pure, and almost he could hear her soul tone in the call. Hostility had been replaced with concern. And he saw her, kneeling with fright amidst churning lava and smoking fires. She didn't burn. She never did. Taln, I like not that look in your eyes, she pled. What is happening? Taln, speak to me. Lava cooled beneath his feet, and the fires above withered. The canopy reformed itself, growing from ashen sticks back into normal wooden beauty. Taln exhaled, seating himself. He held out a forestalling hand to calm Yasna's concern, but she pulled forward anyway, laying a hand on his knee. What was it? she asked quietly. What did you see? I... It was not a thing he could explain, for it was not a thing he yet understood. Something was very wrong with this return. It is nothing, Yasna, he said. Just burdens. 
when you've lived as long as I, you pick up many of them. He paused, then smiled tiredly. Suddenly he felt exhausted. We certainly are growing proficient at manipulating one another. I thought we'd agreed not to squabble any more. Yasna blushed slightly, moving to sit back in her original position. She froze, however. Her unshod foot had touched one of the gemstones, which had been carelessly dropped from uncertain hands when the fires came. The pole stones now lay scattered across the stones at Tuln's feet. Yasna sat for a moment, and he knew what she would be feeling. She could hear the pole tone, the pure and resonant sound of an unsoiled essence. She heard it, but not with a regular sense. She heard it vibrating with her own soul. And she would find it beautiful. It would be even more powerful for her than it had been for him. The Elin, by virtue of their bond, had powerful soul tones, unchangeable by awakening. Though he had used the power for many, many years, he had never been very strong at it, and his body had never displayed any of the changes awakening caused. He was far better at stone warding. Yasna stiffened suddenly, pulling her leg away. Tom stooped down, gathering up the gemstones. I'm sorry, he said. I shouldn't have tried to shame you into awakening. I am just amazed that your kingdom would pass up an awakener. During most eras your kind were far too valuable not to train. They're still valuable, Yasna said. My father and uncle would have forced me to join with the Awakeners, had they known of my skill. Tom paused, frowning. Then he dumped the rest of the gems in the pouch. How is that possible? What of the Charon? Please tell me that it has not been forgotten. We worked so hard to institute it. The charan is still performed, Yasna said. Her voice was slow and had an absent quality to it, not distracted, just reserved. I discovered my abilities before I came of age. Ah, oh, Tone said. It was rare, very rare. Usually a soul had to hear another soul tone for its own latent power to mature. That was one of the prime reasons for the Charon, to use awakening on every young adolescent so that if they had skill themselves it could be discovered. For a child to learn awakening without the Charon. I was only seven at the time, Yasna said. By the winds, Tom breathed. So young, she would be incredibly powerful. Yasna continued to speak, her voice quiet. I did it by accident the first time. I didn't even know what I was doing. But it was so strong, so powerful, and violent. I was visiting the home of a distant cousin. His city obtained most of its profit from an obsidian mine. So much of the stone. It called to me even though the mine was well outside the city wall. I went to it and... She shuddered slightly. During the days of the Epic Kingdoms, it had been called the Conversion. The very first time an Awakener, or Apelian, used his or her abilities, it came out as a magnificent roar of power. It took most Awakeners decades to reach a point where they could reproduce an effect like that first amazing remaking. With a child of her strength, the Conversion must have been extraordinary. They never discovered what happened to the mine, Yasna said. Fortunately, I went there at night, drawn almost mindlessly to a call I did not understand. The burst of destruction, the conversion of a thousand brickweights of stone into black smoke, went unseen in the darkness. I left a gouge in the land the size of a mansion, causing the entire cavern complex to collapse. I don't know how I crawled back to the city. I don't even know how I survived. I remember the vibration, though, inside me, inside my soul. 
I felt agony, so much that I couldn't even think. It felt as if, as if you were going to be consumed by the soul tone of the gemstone you touched, Talon said. As if you too would be transformed into smoke. And puff away, Yasna said, staring out into the morning sky. Like the rocks I had destroyed. My parents thought I had caught a shaking fever, and that the fever delusions had led me from the house had made me wander the streets unseeing. I was bedridden for two months, spitting blood, shaking from a thunderclap no one else had been able to hear. From that day on, I could hear gemstones in my mind. I knew what that meant, and knew what it would do to me. I'd heard the stories, even seen my father's awakeners on occasion. At first I was just frightened. I didn't want to admit what it was, even to myself. Did you never have an impulse to seek out help? Tom asked carefully. Tell your parents what you were? I considered it, of course, Yasna said. I was almost convinced to go to my father. But then something happened in court. The son of Lord Davis, one of my father's shard-bearers, was discovered to be an awakener at his charon. And they took him away. Away from his parents. Away from his friends. I couldn't do that. I wouldn't let them take me. I wouldn't let them bring back that pain I had felt, let them transform me into one of those alien creatures that served my father. Even if they found out now, they would take me away. They would take the court from me and lock me away in a virtual prison where I wouldn't be allowed to have anything to do with anything. She reached up feeling the single tear on her cheek, then holding it up uncertainly as if confused by its appearance. Finally, she rubbed finger against thumb and looked back at him. The court is everything I have, Talm. It is everything I've ever had. I won't let them take me from it. Talm nodded slowly, regarding her. She was so young, barely into her thirties, he had seen as many millennia pass as she had seen decades, and he felt he hadn't really begun to understand the world until he was well into his tenth century. And yet, she was so capable. She had learned so much, considering her short time alive. Sometimes it put him to shame how much these people could accomplish when they didn't have the crutch of immortality. He rose to go. Leave the bag, Yasna said. I will consider your suggestion. I won't reveal myself, but I may find time for some practice. Chapter 56 Shinri 10 Shinri's first obstacle was her own reticence. Despite her decision to escape, Despite her knowledge that she wouldn't soon find another opportunity as good, she found herself hesitating and delaying. Those eyes were always with her. His eyes, looking at her as if from the side, making her question her judgment. Aven was not a man whose threats were trivial. He would send his assassins after her. But Yasna escaped from him, Shinri reminded herself, as she walked down a quiet palace hallway her right-hand fingers trailing along the wall beside her, her left hand carrying a reed-woven basket. Yasna's escape lent Shinri strength, for it meant that he was not infallible. Avan's power over Shinri seemed complete, but it wasn't. She could escape. King Amelin had offered her protection, and so she would flee to him. Avan wouldn't be able to follow after her. Or would he? Shinri paused in the hallway beside an open window, looking out. The vantage overlooked the lower plateau and the spread of the town below, a city full of people as much prisoners as herself. If she did escape to Thelena, what assurance did she have 
that Avan wouldn't be able to come after her. The strange power Shinri had over the Oath Gates. What if others had it as well? Perhaps she had just been the most convenient one for Avan to control. She still didn't even know how he had discovered her ability. Why would he know things about herself that even she did not? You're second-guessing yourself again, Shinri, she thought. King Amelin can keep his oath gate guarded. Even if Avan does find another like you, he'll have a far more difficult time assaulting a city that's prepared for his trick. Shinri sighed, resting against the window's rim and placing her basket on the sill. The hallway behind was empty. She was in the Remac wing of the palace, a section that hadn't been used regularly in centuries. Servants still visited and cleaned, closing the storm shutters for high storms and keeping the stones free from crom, but there was little need for either activity during the searing. For the moment, at least, she was alone. Avan's departure had left her with a shade more freedom. While many soldiers remained in the city, the great majority had gone with him to Crossguard. The direct manifestation of this was Shinri's lack of guards. Of course, the ramps down to the city were very well guarded, as were the oath gates. In a way, the palace itself was just a massive prison. Even without a guard escort, Shinri had been forced to work a little bit to obtain true solitude. Handmaidens could be a very tenacious lot, especially when they assumed that becoming Shinri's confidant was a sure and quick way to political power. Most of them had yet to realize what Shinri knew instinctively, that Avan had no intention of leaving political maneuvering to the women. Shinri would be no pathway to power. Instead, she would be a symbol of Avan's new courtly feminine ideal. To him, a woman was a thing that looked pretty and was always obedient, more like the Shin women were said to be. Unfortunately, Avan's intentions for social revolution were only the most minor of the dangers he posed to Roshar. She could see his intention in those eyes, laid bare by the connection and understanding he had given her through their forced intimacy. He would not stop with Alethkar. Avan wanted what no man had ever obtained, total dominance of Roshar. He wished to succeed where the seven conquerors, even legendary Jarna, had failed. That was why she had to escape, not just for herself, but for Roshar. If she stayed, he would use her to open the oath gates. He would strike against Prala, Thalana, and Shinovar. The last would be difficult, but with the united forces of the Kanaran peninsulas behind him, Avan Vedanel could not be allowed to claim the known world as his own. The creature who owned those cruel eyes could not be entrusted with the fates and lives of so many. That knowledge was what finally gave her the strength to overcome her fearful reluctance. The handmaidens had been her second problem. No escape would have been possible beneath their clinging eyes. Fortunately, she had found an easy pathway to freedom. Kanaran women did not like to walk. Shinri stood, stretching slightly then picked up her basket and continued her wandering down the disused hallway. A thin sheet of dust bespoke the recent absence of cleaners. Had Avan left orders for servants to clean the unoccupied wings? If he hadn't, the dust would quickly mount. Idly, Shinri wondered if that would be such a bad thing. The dust had its own beauty about it, the beauty of sleep and restfulness, of a place undisturbed. Getting rid of her attendants had required more walking than even she was accustomed to. However, the new palace members had quickly come to understand that Shinri was a woman of odd mannerisms. She remembered with a smile the first time she had idly tipped over a vase, letting it crash to the stone floor and shatter into a thousand ceramic shards. Yasna would never have let her get away with something so blatant. 
Now, however, Shinri was the one in charge, at least ostensibly. Destroying the vase had gone a long ways toward unwinding her tension, and she had been able to turn back to her glyph painting with a far more relaxed hand. The other women in the room, however, had sat for a long while, staring at the broken vase, with confusion and a hint of fright. After that, Shinri had been certain to break things far more regularly. No, they had not thought it all that uncharacteristic for the eccentric Lady Shinri to begin taking five-hour strolls through the palace. The more resilient ones tried to tag along at first, then the blisters and the sore feet had appeared. After that, not ten days had passed before Shinri was able to consistently set out on walks and find herself completely unaccompanied. Shinri passed through several intersections, slowly making her way back toward occupied hallways, though she stayed away from the oath gates. The last time she had lingered too close, the guards there had escorted her back to her rooms, then left her under guard for an entire day. Shinri did not doubt that they had acted upon specific orders from Avon, and she didn't want to consider the punishments he had left, should she ignore this first warning. No, the oath gates were still a couple of steps away. She had other things to consider first. One of the more important lessons Yasna had taught her was one of perspective. Vast problems differed from small ones, only in the number of steps it took to overcome them. When clever people failed, it was often because they tried to accomplish those steps in the wrong order. The oath gates were guarded by ten men by day and five at night. Both shifts had a shard bearer, and even the regular men were sordid noblemen. The prison section of the palace, however, was only guarded by one aging soldier. Shinri turned one final corner and found him exactly where he usually was, half dozing in a chair at the end of the hallway. The detention cells were on the other side of the central arcade from the oath gates. This sector of the palace, while used occasionally, was populated only sparsely, mostly by guard patrols or palace staff members on errands. There were two double hallways of cells, none of which had been used very often during Elokar's reign. There were far more appropriate dungeons for common citizen criminals. The palace cells were intended for prisoners of more important reputation. Men such as the son and adopted shard-bearer of Lord Dalinar Colin. The fact that Marin and Renarin had been placed in the palace cells indicated that Avon saw their potential worth as bargaining tools. However, the lax guard indicated that Avon currently thought them to be of little value. Avon intended to defeat the Alith armies with ease. Renarin and Marin were backup tools, not vital prisoners. Or, at least, that was what Shinri hoped. If she was wrong, then a goodly amount of planning would have to be revised. She shifted her basket to the other hand, then walked down the hallway with what she hoped was an innocent-looking step. The guard perked up lethargically, standing and bowing slightly as she approached. He was a nobleman, a sword was at his waist, but he couldn't have been very high-ranking, else he wouldn't have earned such an undesirable post. My lady, he said. Shinri paused in front of him. Evening's blessing, soldier, she said. I've come to bring the prisoners some food. The guard rubbed his chin, which bore a Vaden-style square beard. They've been fed already, my lady. I'm sure they have, Shinri said. Though I doubt the meal was of enviable quality, I think they would appreciate something a little more healthy. The soldier frowned. It isn't good to keep prisoners too healthy, my lady, he said. It encourages escape. It isn't good for them to be sickly, either, Shinri replied. 
My husband may have need of these men, and I intend to see that they are kept alive in case that need arises. Cruelty may be your prerogative, soldier, but mercy is mine, a right granted me by the Almighty. The man's face grew troubled as he considered. If he were too low a rank, he would take the matter to his superior. Shinri was counting on his noble upbringing and the independence it usually inspired. I brought some for you, too, Shinri noted, pulling back the napkin to reveal the bread rolls underneath. It's only bread, soldier. I doubt you'll find that it makes your prisoners too healthy to be manageable. I'll have to check the baskets first, the soldier finally said. Very well, Shinri replied, handing it to him. You're a little more clever than I had hoped, aren't you? That's a pity. He opened the basket, then systematically began breaking each roll in half to check for contraband, as if a high lady would actually have bothered to cook them herself. Shinri sighed inwardly, folding her arms and waiting upon the man's inspection. How have they been so far? she asked as he worked. I trust you haven't been keeping them too unhealthy. The soldier shrugged, ripping apart a roll. The one on the left stays pretty quiet. He's a little one, and I doubt he could be of much trouble if he wanted to. The one on the right... Well, he's obviously a soldier, tall lad and well-muscled. Could have been trouble, but I think the captivity took the heart out of him. He screamed and yelled a lot at first, but then got really quiet. Shinri frowned. He's still alive, I assume? The soldier snorted. He eats his food, my lady. That means he's alive enough. But I don't know if he's still got his mind or not. I've guarded men like him before, men who couldn't deal with being kept locked up. They usually quiet up after a while, if only because they get tired of yelling. What a delightfully kind-hearted one you are, Shinri thought sourly, as the man selected a few rolls for himself, then handed the basket back to her. I guess that's how you ended up a jailer. Shinri nodded her satisfaction, then brushed past the man into the hallway. He stayed behind, thankfully, settling into his chair to work on the rolls. Technically, Shinri was a first lady, his queen. Even if he had denied her entrance, he should never have treated her with the disrespect he had displayed. Oven's touch, virulent and destructive as a winter mold, was spreading already. Shinri selected the leftmost hallway. The hallways were relatively well lit and kept clean, unlike some dungeons Shinri had heard of. But there was a definite smell of unwashed bodies to the place. The cells were all open but one, and it bore a stout wooden door. A small window at the top provided a glimpse inside, though it was high enough up that Shinri would have trouble looking in without getting up on her toes. She approached the door with trepidation. Renarin? she asked in a quiet voice, glancing back toward the guard. There was a pause. Oh, hello, Shinri, Renarin's familiar voice eventually said back. How are you? Shinri started slightly. Um, I'm fine, she lied, frowning. Even locked in a cell, kept half-starved, you're a strange one, Renarin. My family is allied with King Arvin. I talked the guard into letting me bring you some food. That was kind of you, Renarin said. His tone sounded distracted, but, well, that was kind of how he always was. So, you're the one who opened the oath gate? I wasn't expecting it to be you, but I probably should have been able to figure it out. I'm far too new at this. Shinri nearly dropped the basket in shock. How did you know that? She hissed. There was no answer. Renarin, Shinri said a little bit louder. 
We need to escape, Renarin finally said, ignoring her question. That's why I'm here, Shinri said, bending down and sliding back the feeding plate at the base of the door. Here, take these rolls so the guard doesn't get suspicious. I was thinking that we should- Oh, don't tell me, Renarin said. Tell Marin. Renarin's face appeared in the opening. He didn't look too haggard, though he hadn't shaved in a while. His beard was dark and a bit patchy, making him look even younger than he was. Behind him, Shinri could make out something on the floor, something that looked like scribbles of some sort. Renarin accepted the bread. Marin is on the other side, he said. He can work with you on getting us out. I'm too busy right now. Thank you for the bread. With that, he slid the plate closed with a motion that felt oddly like he were locking her out of his private study. Shinri knelt, stupefied for a moment. I will never understand that boy, she thought with frustration, rising. She walked back down the hallway shooting a glance at the guard, then turned down the second parallel corridor. Marin's cell was directly opposite Renarin's, and here Shinri paused, basket held before her, staring at the blank door. She had avoided thinking much about Tethryn. Everything else, her marriage, the invasion, Avon, was just too recent. Her soul already bore a ten set fresh wounds, there was no need to prod at one that had begun to scab over. She didn't completely believe that Tethryn was dead, but she knew that she probably wouldn't ever be completely satisfied, for she had seen no body. She had made what peace she could during those months spent searching out what had happened to him. Her grief for Tethryn was a distant thing, dulled by time and distance. In a way, her guilt over not feeling worse was even more painful than her sense of loss. Yet for reasons she knew were irrational, the boy inside the cell before her was a focus for both emotions. She needed him if she were going to escape. Even from a distance, she had heard rumored praises of Marin's natural fighting ability. The court's men had been intimidated by this boy who had saved the king's life twice. A boy who already after just a few months' time, knew how to duel well enough to stand against noblemen who had been training all their lives. Yes, she needed this boy. Renarin alone would not be enough to get her past the guards and to the oath gates. Unfortunately, Shinri knew that if she was going to work with Merin Colin, she would need to know the truth about Tethryn. Bad news is not a thing to be avoided. Lady Yasna had always said. Better to learn things that bring you pain than to remain in the greater agony of ignorance. Shinri stepped up to the cell door's window, going up on her toes and peeking in. The cell was sparse and small. Merin looked little better than Renarin did, though he appeared far more a man with his soldier's build and even beard. He sat at the back of the room, legs folded, hand held before him, with one finger pointing toward the ceiling. He was staring intently at the finger, as if in some sort of trance. Wonderful, Shinri thought, anticipating another conversation like the one with Renarin. The guard was right. His mind's gone. Marin, she asked. Marin Colin? The boy looked up, lowering his hand slightly and focusing on the window. He sat for a moment, then leapt to his feet with excitement. I know you, he said, rushing to the window. Lady Yasna's ward. Shinri paused, slightly taken aback. Shinri Devar, she said, lowering herself from her toes and speaking through the door. Am I to be released? Marin asked with excitement. Has King Elokar retaken the palace? Hush, Shinri said, glancing toward the guard, who didn't appear to have noticed Marin's exclamation. The palace is under Vaden control. I am suffered because I am a relation of their king. 
They think I'm only bringing you some bread. Oh, Marin's voice sounded disappointed. Renarin and I need to escape, he said after a few moments. Can you help us? Perhaps, Shinri said. I might be able to discover a time when the oath gates will be open for us, but they are guarded by five men. Us? Marin asked. I'm going with you, Shinri said. It's complicated, but I cannot stay in Ral Aram any longer. Marin was quiet for a moment. I'll need my blade, he finally said. You need to get me a shard blade. You say that as if finding one were as easy as sneaking extra dessert from the palace kitchens. That may not be possible, Shinri said. Let me think about it. Today I just wanted to make sure you were both fit and sane, or in Renarin's case, as close to sane as possible. It's just good to talk to someone, Marin said, his voice sounding relieved. Someone other than Renarin, that is. He's a good man, but he's a little... Strange? Shinri asked. Strange, Marin agreed. I need to give you the bread and be going, Shinri said, kneeling down. I'll be back, though. When? I don't know, Shinri said. In a few days, at most. She slid open the feeding plate, then opened her basket. She paused, however. There is something else, she said, moving to hand him the bread. The man you killed on the battlefield, the one whose shard blade you earned. Can you remember anything about him? Marin's face appeared behind the plate. He frowned in confusion. The man in Prala? he asked. Yes. He shrugged. I don't know. There wasn't much time to think, and he wore full shard plate. I didn't see his face, only his horse charging toward the king. Shinri kept her face expressionless as Marin accepted the bread. Nothing else? she asked. There was nothing distinctive about him? Nothing you remembered about him or his armor? Marin paused. Then he suddenly grew excited, setting his bread on the floor beside him. He grabbed a small rock from behind him and scratched something into the stone. Do you recognize this glyph? he asked eagerly. Shinri frowned at his awkward scrawl, obviously made by the hand of one who didn't know proper slants or line orders. It was still recognizable, however, as Nan, one of the more common glyphs. Yes, Shinri said. Why? I found a rock carved with this symbol tucked inside the dead shard bearer's gauntlet, Marin said. What does it mean? Shinri's frown deepened. The symbol was slightly off. It might have been Marin's unpracticed hand but there were a few extra lines. It looked almost like... Shinri couldn't stop her slight intake of breath. What? Marin asked. There's something special about it, isn't there? It's a glyph of power. I... I think it's magical somehow. Don't be silly, Shinri said. He's just a peasant, she reminded herself. To most of them, all writing is mystical. Don't snap at him. The glyph means lightning, she said. I've seen it hundreds of times. There's nothing magical about it. Why the reaction, then? Marin demanded. Those lines you drew at the sides, Shinri said. They're familiar to me. They make the symbol look very similar to a stylized glyph, the type used by noblemen to differentiate their various lines. Marin frowned. Well. Whose glyph is this one? Shinri closed her eyes, sitting back. The queen's, she said. Queen Nanava. That doesn't make any sense, Marin complained. Why would the shard bearer be carrying it? He wanted my sister. Even from a distance, Avan's words taunted her. He loved her with the deep, foolish love men reserve for something unattainable. The stone, Shinri said. 
carved with a lady's glyph. It is a sign of favor given to a friend or loved one. You have to be wrong, Marin said. I wish I was. There's no reason for the man to be carrying a stone carved with Queen Nanava's glyph, Marin said. Maybe I drew it wrong. I'm telling you there was something magical about that glyph. I can't really explain it, but trust me, it was there. Maybe his mind has been affected by the captivity, Shinri thought, standing. I'll return, she said, picking up her basket. He never really wanted you, Avin hissed in her mind. He couldn't have. You were given to him freely. Get me a shard blade, Merrin repeated, his face appearing in the cell window. I have to go help Lord Dalinar. Shinri nodded, turning and walking down the hallway. Before, she'd had the benefit of presumption, as long as Avin's words had been her only proof of Tethryn's love of the queen, Shinri had been able to disbelieve. But now... The man is dead, Shinri told herself. Months gone. His infidelity shouldn't matter. What power has he over you? You were in there a long time, the guard said as she passed. Spent a while chatting, didn't you? Shinri paused, wrestling down her emotions and giving the guard a flat stare. I had to make certain the prisoners were fit, she said. My only concern is that they be healthy enough to be of use to my husband. Of course, the guard said, reclining in his chair. Very good of you. Next time, bring some money. Shinri thinned her eyes slightly at the man, then nodded and turned down the hallway to make her way back toward her chambers. Chapter 57 Lon 1 Lon Radenmev had only ever been good at two things in his life. The first was avoiding responsibility. The second was helping people. Some called it altruism. That, however, was far too noble a word. Lon understood himself and, with all frankness, knew himself to be a selfish, lethargic man. However, he had always been interested in people. When growing up, his only inborn asset had been his tongue. He could get anyone to talk to him, even those who didn't particularly like him. The variety he saw in personalities, attitudes, and opinions had fascinated him even as a child. Others thought that because Lon had little regard for possessions, he was humble. That was a mistake. If Lon ignored the baubles and finery that had delighted his brother, sister, and their noble friends, it was only because he was busy with objects far more splendid. People. The young Lon had met as many individuals as he could, prompting them to speak, using his strange ability to put them at ease to discover their true opinions and emotions. He had a gift in his ability to make strangers open up and speak to him as if they were confiding in a spouse rather than some random shard-bearer's son. Lon listened to their ramblings with rapt attention, collecting minds in the same way a wealthy merchant might gather precious works of art. The more interesting and strange the personality, the more excited Lon was to speak with its owner. The benefit his subjects gained from these discussions had been quite unexpected. He soon became a topic of discussion among the Kolinar elite. The ladies in their sitting groups would speak about Chadden Radenmev's firstborn son. They referred to Lon by all manner of praiseful adjectives, respectful, wise, sober. That last one had particularly bothered Lon, and so he had decided to disprove it by getting himself quite drunk on his twelfth birthday. Lon's father hadn't quite known what to do with the boy. In Lon's mind, Chadden had been anything but interesting. He was a straightforward, stout bull of a man, a loyal shard-bearer to King Nolanarin, but otherwise rather unimpressive. Looking back, Lon thought that his father had probably been a very good and noble person, a man whose only crime had been being less clever than his son would have liked. 
At the time, however, Lon had found his family incurably boring, and had instead preferred to spend his time with more lively subjects, such as the gossiping palace maids, or the men confined to the stocks in the courtyard, or even, when he could manage it, the mysterious awakeners of Nolanarin's court. Regardless of the reasonings, Chadden hadn't seen in Lon the wise young man that the court seemed to think he had spawned. To him, Lon had just been a disrespectful slop of a boy who refused to learn proper discipline, and who found great amusement in mocking his own father. Back then, people often told Lon that his tongue would get him in trouble, but he usually quipped that there wasn't any trouble his tongue could bring that his wit wouldn't be able to solve. Then the day had come when his father had realized an amazing fact— that there was an easy, court-approved way to remove Lon from the succession, thereby allowing Chadden to pass his blade and title on to Lon's younger brother, a boy far more modest in both acumen and action. Lon had found himself in the monastery the very next day. It hadn't even been a scandal. People had often remarked that Chadden's thoughtful little boy possessed a gift for helping people. What better place was there for such a person than in Peace Home Monastery? No amount of wit had been able to free Lon from the pact his father made. Lon was birth-given, and would remain a monk until the day he died. At first, Lon hadn't realized how perfect the monastery was for him. After all, it gave him wonderful opportunities to develop both of his strengths. There had been no lack of responsibilities to avoid— and Peace Home, as an order of Cavill Monastery, saw a constant rotation of the poor, the wounded, and even the insane. Fascinating personalities abounded. It hadn't taken long for Lon to bless his father's decision rather than resent it. The other monks had been surprised by Lon's willingness to work with the mad, but they had been more than willing to give him the duty— in many of their minds it was a fitting punishment for his fondness of avoiding work. Only the wizened Peace Home first monk had seen some of the truth in Lon's motivations. The man had never gone so far as to forbid Lon's work with the insane, but he had always warned, as if speaking with the same spirit as those who had spoken of Lon's troublemaking tongue, that Lon's fascination with madmen would eventually lead him to poor ends. For the first time in his life, Lon had a mind to agree with the old corpse. What was Lon, lover of peaceful mornings, relaxing afternoons, and quiet evenings, doing on a cliffside in northern Remac? Why was he standing beside soldiers and shard-bearers, holding a spear as if he thought he might know what to do with it? The idea was so ridiculous that at times he laughed. And yet there he was, standing in the evening light, wearied from marching, drawn halfway across the continent by the most fascinating personality he had ever found. Tom stood at the very edge of the cliffside, scanning the rock plains below them. Apparently northern Remac was a progressive gradient, the land rising to what would eventually become the desolate stormlands of Kavinar. Several days before, the group had arrived at a set of step-like plateaus leading up. Lon cringed when he remembered lugging his pack all the way up those switchbacks. There were apparently more plateaus ahead, but they had passed the greater deal of the climbing. The land they would now have to travel consisted of a series of broken plateaus, the stone pocketed and slashed by rain channels. It was colder than Lon would have expected, despite it being the searing, and the winds swept across the army's line unbroken and strong. He hated to think how it would feel in a high storm. Talm the Madman looked down toward the path they had taken just a few days before, scanning for something the scouts had reported. Of all the mines Lon had seen, this was the strangest. At first, Lon had assumed that Ton was just another delusional man. Lon had met many during his days at Peace Home. 
Tone had soon proven himself different from any other person Lon had met. Other delusionals did not like to be confronted by the truth. They couldn't listen to criticism and argued violently when their truths were confronted. Tone did none of this. In fact, most of the time he seemed quite accepting of others' perception of him. Yet there was a kernel of the standard delusional in him, an instability that manifested at certain times of great stress. Yes, Tolm was a madman. The fact that he didn't completely fit the profile was what made him so fascinating to Lon. Now Lon was paying the debts for his curiosity. Why had he thought to accompany Tolm on his quest? How had he let himself be drawn away from Peace Home and his life of comfort? It wouldn't be so bad if Lon hadn't felt so out of place. The men expected spirituality from him, but Lon had neglected that side of his training. Fortunately, he had been able to pilfer several pages from the arguments from the monastery in Marcabe to use for crash memorization sessions. There was more. The men expected certain things from a monk, and these Lon could fake. Tolm, however, often looked to him for... what? Reliance? Suggestions? Lon had ignored his childhood lessons in military tactics and masculine arts, and had never seen fit to revisit them during his monastery days, despite the fact that any art, whether it be tactics, painting, or swordplay, was open to him as a monk. What did Tolm want from him? Lon had forced his way into the man's company, but now, instead of resenting him, as many would, Tolm looked to him for advice. That fact was discomforting enough, but Lon's sincere desire to make Tolm proud of him was a completely unexpected emotion. Lon was a fool. He had known that fact for most of his life. But having the knowledge and facing it, were apparently different things. Alethkar was in danger of being destroyed by invaders, and Lon had an opportunity to help save it. Only he had no skills, little knowledge, and poor training. All three situations were his fault. There, Tolm said suddenly, pointing below. The other members of the command group, Lord Meridos, the arrogant, Lord Kemnar, the unassuming, and Lords Unimportant, the flunkies, perked up at Tuln's comment. Meridas looked as if he would challenge Tuln's assertion, but held his tongue. The scouts had already told them that there were groups of men below. It would be foolish to challenge Tuln. Besides, the madman's eyesight had proven itself superior on several occasions. Meridas. Now there was another fascinating person. The Lord had given Lon little opportunity to speak with him. Meridas guarded his time not for its own sake, but for the way it made him look by always being too busy to take visitors. However, Lon could easily tell there was more to this fop than he projected. There was a strength below the arrogance, and the wit to use it as well. Of course, despite his unusual attributes, Meridas was still a fop. Apparently even fops could have some depth to them, and that fact made the nobleman twice as fascinating as any humble, badgered studying lord. How many? Kemnar asked. That was another one. The nobleman who felt guilty for his own privilege, a man who avoided leadership not because of the responsibility it brought, but because he worried that he wouldn't do a good enough job. A man who sought out the company of thieves because, subconsciously, he found their morals less threatening than the ones he himself was expected to live. Yes, despite the hardships, despite the humiliation, Lon decided that he was glad to be on the trip, if only for the people it contained. One didn't often find men like Kemnar, Tal, and Meridas, let alone get the opportunity to watch the three interact. At least fifty people, Tuln said in response to Kemnar's question, and other specks in the distance that could be more. Soldiers, Meridas asked. Tuln squinted in the waning light. They're too far away, he said. We'll have to wait until the scouts get back. Meridas frowned, folding his arms. 
Of course the nobleman had good reason to be frustrated. The fractured crags and valleys of the Remak plateaus had frustrated the army's progress. The high storms would begin again in a couple of days, and those in the know claimed that flooding would prove dangerous. Talon kept mumbling at the terrible loss of Remak's highway system, a thing that hadn't existed for over half a millennium. Trackers claimed to have discovered several trails, though when they pointed them out, Lon saw only scattered rock buds and monochrome rocks. Yet Talon claimed the rock bud polyps there were smaller and younger, bespeaking routes sometimes used by passing caravans. But if they took the army down one of the supposed roads only to find themselves blocked when the path dead-ended at a wash or rift in the rock, the time wasted backtracking and trying again would be great. Scouts could move far more quickly than the army itself, and they had been sent to find high ground and determine the best way north. Even Meridas had agreed that waiting for the scout reports was a move that would ultimately save time. However, Waiting in the same place for three days had made Meridas tense. As far as Lon had heard, there were no reports of immediate pursuit. Talon claimed that their marching speed would make it difficult for non-mounted enemies to catch them. Unfortunately, they also had no information from the east. The status of Alethkar's armies, if they hadn't been destroyed already, was an ominous worry common to most of their company. The men spoke of their concerns often to Lon, wondering if they should have remained behind to defend Marcabe if invaders came. Lon carefully pointed out that without Tong's weapons and formation training, they probably wouldn't have been of much use to their town. They were better off where they were, marching to their king's defense. If it is a Vaden attack party, Kemnar noted, our position at the top of the ridge is enviable. It wouldn't be wise to move now. More delays, Meridas said with thin-lipped frustration, marching forward to stand beside Tuln and scan the plains. Kemnar snorted quietly beside Lon. I'm surprised Meridas even bothers with the act, he said quietly. He can't expect us to believe he cares for Alethkar or its king. I'm half certain he'd join with our invaders if he had the chance. Lon shrugged. I wouldn't say that. Meridas has put a lot of effort into Alethkar. Effort he probably doesn't want to see dashed by an untimely change in governments. Besides, he's a well-known associate of the king. If they capture the kingdom, Elokar's Parsons will be among the first noblemen to be executed. No, I'd say Meridas has a very healthy desire to keep Alethkar safe. Kemnar raised an eyebrow at the comment, but nodded thoughtfully. Lon looked away from him, toward where Meridas was studying the plains below. Lon could see distrust in the man's eyes. Meridas probably thought that Tuln was lying about being able to see the men below in order to enhance his reputation for having superior senses. Perhaps he was right. Tuln was, after all, only confirming what the scouts below had seen. We will wait, Meridas finally announced. Then he swept away, attendance in tow. He paused a few steps later, however, glancing back at Lon and the others. Oh, and by the way, dear Lord Kemnar, I don't think that you have any place questioning my loyalty. Kemnar blushed deeply as he realized his comment had been overheard. Instead, perhaps you should ask yourself this, Meridas continued. Why exactly is the madman so concerned with the training of our men? Does he work for Alethkar's good or for his own? With that, he left. Meridas's words turned out to be almost prophetic, in a twisted way, their pursuers were indeed armed, but they were not from Vadenar. Lon stood with Meridas's troops, his spear held at the ready, sweating nervously like the rest of them. Their captains had seen to their placement, organizing them in formations that could quickly be manipulated to accommodate the unpredictability of battle. Still, with only a hundred and eighty men, theirs seemed a small army. 
Lon was near the front, and he was able to see the cautious group of ten men that climbed up the final incline to the plateau's top. They were a ragged bunch, yet they held their spears with warriors' hands. They wore dark leather armor, stained with dye, sweat, and probably blood, that had been patched in numerous places. Who are you? called one of Meridas's attendants. Lon thought it was Chathan, though he got the two mixed up. The newcomers paused, regarding the soldiers arrayed before them with grim eyes. One stepped forward. We seek the Herald's army, he called. There was a pause at this. Finally, Chathan, acting as Meridas's mouthpiece, spoke again. To whom do your loyalties belong? They belong to you. If you'll feed us, the man said. Are you recruiting soldiers or not? And apparently they were, for Meridas eventually accepted the mercenaries into their company. They were not the last. Lady Yasna claimed that she should have seen it. Remak was historically the place militaries went when they needed to hire additional spears. It would stand to reason that the mercenary bands would be in a state of flux, kicking out and gathering new members even as the groups themselves were dissolved and reformed. Their members would always be seeking work. Some came as those first seeking work. Others came not as mercenaries, but as pilgrims. Somehow stories of Taln's exploits in Ral Aram had managed to reach even the assumedly sheltered communities of Remak. Tales had spread, stories of Taln defeating hundreds of soldiers on his own. Rumors claimed that the return had come, and that the storm shades were attacking mankind again. Stories whispered that Taln had come to refound Remak and to free its people from their lives of uncertainty and chaos. Some said that he was insane, but that he had the power of an awakener and was commanding an army of thralls. Others said that all ten heralds were in his company, and that they had come to seek support for Alethkar's war, though why heralds would care about protecting one kingdom from another was a point of uncertainty. The more rational among them claimed that there was no herald, that the army belonged to Alethkar itself, and it was seeking mercenaries to help against the Vaden invasion. All of the stories agreed on one thing— Someone was gathering an army. And so they came, some to fight for money, others to fight for hope. Some came for religious reasons, others for simple curiosity. Early in their trip, Taln had suggested to Lon that the land of Remak was hardly as underpopulated as some had claimed. Lon hadn't understood what made Taln so certain, but the madman certainly proved himself correct— as hundreds of soldiers, refugees, and pilgrims dribbled into their ranks. Taln accepted them all into his training sessions, despite Meridas's protests that their group was growing too bulky. Lon suspected, however, that the nobleman had received very definite orders not to turn anyone away. Lon also suspected that he had been the only one who saw the musing, devious glint in Lady Yasna's eyes on that first day, when the mercenaries asked for the Herald's Army. Chapter 58 Jack 9 Jack's son son Valano, truthless of Shinovar, didn't have to sneak to get into the fallen city of Crossguard. King Elkar's guards barely gave Jack and his group a passing glance. The ease of the passage was almost insulting. Jack had been born into the tradition of his clan, trained how to misrepresent himself from the day he could walk. As a child, he had been required to adopt different personas before being given his evening meal. He would spend one day as a lord, the next as a beggar. He learned the stance of the soldier, the air of the craftsman, the step of the entertainer, and the humility of a holy pilgrim, practicing each mannerism so carefully that changing personas eventually came as naturally to him as putting on a different cloak. All of this was wasted in the East. 
The crossguard soldiers needed to see only his shin features before waving him into the captured city. The only shin that came to the east of their own choice were members of the merchant clans, and these were the only shin most Kanarans had met. Jack needed only the most perfunctory disguise to be believable. A waste. Jack ordered his servants forward with a barked command, spoken with an intentionally strong shin accent. None of the Easterners would realize that his normal accent was far too light to belong to a visiting merchant, of course, but Jack wasn't about to let their ignorance spoil a good disguise. Still, he knew that if he did ever manage to get back his bondstone and return to Shinovar, his skills would need some serious refinement. Jack's men, a group of ten soldiers who had been chosen for their Pac-Man-like appearances, moved forward at the command, carrying large packs on their backs. Jack stood, ostensibly overseeing their progress through the gate. His eyes flickered to the sides, however, doing a quick head count of soldiers on the city walls. There were fewer men than he had expected. King Elokar had obviously won Crossguard quickly, but he had done so at a great price. Avin's spies had estimated Elokar's army at forty thousand strong before the assault. Including the men camped outside, Jack counted barely twenty-five thousand remaining. A heavy toll indeed, though Crossguard had obviously suffered worse. The massive gap in the city wall stood as a testament to King Elokar's corruption. The city-goers, both soldiers and townspeople, tried to avoid looking at the crumbled structure. Even they knew that the holy powers were not supposed to be used in such a way. Yet Elokar's desecration had won the day, and Jack doubted any other Kanaran leader would have done differently. Honor was simply a word to these people— when the time came to test their devotion, beliefs crumbled faster than the crossguard's stones. This was not the first time Awakeners had been used in battle, and it would not be the last. Other than the wall, however, the city was remarkably hale. King Elokar was not so much a fool that he would allow the looting of his own city, and the people obviously knew this. While there was a strong military presence in Crossguard, the common citizens bustled about their business as if their local aristocracy hadn't just been purged in a bloody assault. In fact, Jack suspected that Crossguard was even busier this day than normal. Armies were good business. There was a reason Jack had been allowed into the city so easily. Now that the fighting was through, merchants from across the region would be flocking to Crossguard to relieve the soldiers of their battle pay. The city taverns, of both the lord and the citizen variety, were likely full every night, and the local whores busier than usual. Jack shook his head, stepping forward to trail after his pack-men. Something bothered him about the troop arrangements, but he couldn't quite decide what. It had been nagging him ever since he had first counted numbers while passing the camp on his way into the city. There was something odd about the way the camp was arranged. Unfortunately, while he had been trained to imitate a soldier, he actually knew very little about tactics or armies. He would need to gather more information and bring it back to those who could properly interpret it. Most importantly, he needed to discover King Elokar's plans— Fortunately, Jack had access to a resource that was often as informative as any spy or secret informant. There, Jack commanded, pointing toward a large, if unimpressive, stone tavern built alongside the street ahead. A few gems given to a passing merchant on the road outside had given Jack the location. Every city had its preferred mercantile gathering places, most of them unofficial. If a man didn't have the skill necessary to discover the location, then he probably wasn't a good enough merchant to bother trading with. The packmen stayed outside as they had been ordered previously. They set down Jack's goods in a pile, then arranged themselves around to guard, similar to several other caravans worth of packmen along the street. 
A few barmaids moved among the groups, selling drinks from the tavern. Jack stepped into the building alone. It didn't take the tavern patrons long to give him a collective dark look, one quickly covered up by accommodating faces. Canarins resented the shin sense of superiority in the same way a child resented his parents' freedom and control. While few merchants would willingly pass up dealing with their shin counterparts, the sale of rare shin goods was a very lucrative market, fewer still were respectful in their transactions. "'Friend!' a voice suddenly called, as if to directly contradict Jack's thoughts. "'Here, drink with me! Barkeep, bring this man some good wine!' Jack paused, careful and suspicious. The speaker was a tall man, not broad of chest, but definitely broad of voice. He was waving enthusiastically toward Jack with one hand, while at the same time gesturing toward a barmaid with the other. Jack approached carefully, and the man actually reached out and clapped him on the back with a familial hand, then gestured toward a seat at his table. The man appeared to be dining alone. "'Do I know you?' Jack asked. "'Never met me before in your life,' the man said, shooting a glare at the barmaid and increasing the speed of his impatient gestures. "'However, whatever you're selling, I want to buy it,' Jack hesitated. What makes you so certain? You look like a suspicious type, the man said. You really should try to get over that. Bad for the health, all that worrying. Sit, sit! Barmaid, where is that wine? Against his better judgment, Jack allowed himself to be forced into the seat. The man, finally convinced that the barmaid wasn't ignoring him, slid down into his own chair. Why are you so eager to work with me? Jack asked again. You know, you people shouldn't be so grim all the time, the man said. That's why no one wants to work with the Shin, or that's what I think. Don't people smile over there on the First Peninsula? Or do you all just sit around and scowl at each other all the time? Jack gave the man a pointed scowl, an action that prompted a guffawing laugh. Explain yourself or I will find another table, Jack said. The man leaned forward, giving Jack an intense look and pointing with a firm gesture. Guess how many times I've worked with shin merchants. I really have no idea, Jack said flatly. Twenty-three times, the man said, speaking with his hands as well as his voice. Twenty-three business deals. I count these things. Every good businessman should. Now let me ask another question. Guess how many of those deals went sour? None. Guess how many times I got cheated? Not once. You people are honest as stones, and if the other merchants don't want to work with you, then I say let the storms take them. I'll deal with any shin who passes my way, that's certain. Devon Lale never passes up a good deal, and you, my friend— are the best deal in town. I know that already. The man punctuated his remarks by occasionally slamming his fist against the table, each blow rocking the three different mugs that held his drinks. The barkeep delivered Jack's wine, and she got a wink and a pinch from Devon. Jack watched the exchange with dissatisfaction as he tried to read his companion. It seemed incredible, but he could detect no falsehood in Devon's mannerisms. If the boisterous attitude was an act, then it was one that could fool even a trained Shin assassin. So, what is it? Devon asked. What are you selling? You people never buy, I know that. It's always about what you can sell, as if our goods weren't good enough to take back with you. You know... I'll bet that's why people don't want to deal with the shin. You make them feel like Canaran goods just aren't worth your time, which we both know is ridiculous. You really should work on that. Jack paused. His aleth was good, but he was less practiced at it than he was at Vaden. Following this man's conversation was a task unto itself. I see, Jack said slowly. So, Devin said, Goods? What are they? Boots, Jack said. 
I have a hundred pairs with me as a sample, and could have a thousand here within three weeks. I need a retailer. Boots, eh? Devon asked, rubbing his beardless chin. Shin work, I assume, yes? Good craftsmanship, those. You people really need to teach some of our people how to make them as good as you do. It's not in the art, Jack said, but in the materials. We don't desecrate the holy arts to get our leather, but instead tan it from livestock. You see, there you go again, Devon said, pointing. I love you people, but you really have to stop making excuses. Awakened goods are the same as non-awakened, and that is the truth. But I suppose if you want to keep your secrets, that's your business. Three weeks, eh? That's too long, friend. Never can tell what will happen in three weeks. Jack perked up immediately, sensing something in the merchant's attitude. What's wrong? he asked. King Elokar's army doesn't appear to be going anywhere soon. His kingdom just suffered from civil war. He'll need to stay here for a while and maintain order. Devon shrugged with an exaggerated motion. I'm just saying. Well, you would do well to be a little less curious. It'll only give you worries, I say. He paused, glancing at Jack with eyes akin to those of a performer demanding applause. If I'm going to work with you, Jack said taking the prompt. I'll need to know what you know. Well, since I know you'll keep quiet with it, Devon said with an eagerly conspiratorial air. Of course, Jack said. You see, friend, Devon said with an amazingly quiet voice, there's another army coming here to cross guard. The king's forces might not survive another three weeks. Another army. Jack kept his shock from his face, but on the inside he cringed. Ovin's forces had been discovered. Well, it had only been a matter of time. But why then wasn't King Elokar running? Ovin's army was nearly twice the size of the Aleth force. Elokar had time to retreat, moving to the west to gather troops to his cause. Surely the lords who had been reticent to take arms against Crossguard wouldn't be so restrained concerning a foreign invader. Yes, indeed, Devon whispered. When the tyrant bane is done with dear King Elokar. Well, I plan to be gone from Crossguard by the time he arrives. Jack froze. The tyrant bane, he asked. Dalinar Colin is on his way here? Devon nodded. I have it on very good word. The king's mobilizing his forces for battle again, but I doubt he'll last long against Lord Dalinar. Should have never executed the Parshan's son, that's what I say. Bad idea, that. Dalinar Colin. That changed things drastically. More drastically, even, than if Elokar had discovered Ovin's army. Had Lady Yasna reached Kolinar then? Or was Dalinar's coming a coincidence? Don't know why I'm telling you these things, Devon said, sitting back in his chair. Guess it's because you're Shin. Good people you are. Never lie. That's what I've been told. I sure know I've never been cheated by one of your kind. The thing was, Devon was probably telling the truth. Shin merchants did not break their word. They followed truth and it declared that only the lower clans, the warrior clans, those who ruled to serve, could kill, lie to, or hurt another man. It was doubly sinful to cheat an innocent or a child, and Easterners counted as both. Jack's mind kept returning to Lord Delinar's impending arrival. Oven would want more information, numbers if possible. How many? Jack said. How many in Lord Dalinar's force? I really couldn't say, Devon said. My source doesn't even know that. For some reason there's been some confusion amongst the king's scouts. I'm surprised nobody discovered the tyrant Bane's armies sooner. True, it's moving quickly, 
without towers or chulls, but it got within four days' march of Crossgar before anyone brought word of it. That's because Oven's death parties are riding the main roads, killing anyone they see, especially messengers on horseback. For a time, at least, information in Alethkar was going to be very slow to travel. Elokar could be dead before the noblemen on the far side of the country even knew that Alethkar had been invaded. This information troubles me, friend Devon, Jack said honestly. I think I shall retrieve my goods and bring them here anyway, however. After all, Lord Delanar's army is going to need boots too, eh? Devon laughed. <laughs> That's true. You shin are always so pragmatic. You know, you really should try to loosen up more sometimes. That's probably why people don't want to work with you. You're always so stiff. Always working. But if you're bringing the boots, we might as well arrange a deal. I'll watch for you in town when you return. Promise me you won't sell them to anyone else until you find out if I'm here or not. Of course, Jack said. But I must be going now, to make arrangements. Good, good, Devon said. I'll see you another time then, friend. Remember your promise. <laughs> of course I don't need to tell you that. I never met a shin who lies. You just did, Jack thought, standing. Chapter 59 Yasna 13 How long until it hits? Yasna asked worriedly, looking up at the darkening sky. Talon shook his head. Two hours? Maybe a bit more? Yasna nodded. The searing was over. High storms would fall again. She shivered slightly. The Remak highlands weren't as cold as those of Perlier, but she did not look forward to the soggy chill of high storm rains, not to mention the fury of its winds. This storm wouldn't be anything like the bellow, but on the highlands in the middle of summer, it would be bad enough. I'm almost sad to see them start again, Yasna said. I'm not, Talm said. I'm amazed we're not dying of thirst as it is. Considering that, he waved his hand toward their growing army. Despite its ragged and disjointed nature, Yasna had to smile at the size of the force. Several larger mercenary companies had tracked them down, and that addition, mixed with the increasing numbers of refugees, put their force at nearly 800 strong. Admittedly, that number contained many who had barely a week's worth of training beneath Talm's tutelage. Still, they were of hardy Remax stock, well acquainted with fighting and their weapons, even if they didn't have formalized knowledge of formations or battlefield tactics. It was a varied group, mercenaries mixed with farmers, herald believers with men who just wanted the thrill of battle. But Talm was quickly working to change that, making them into a cohesive force. What had begun as a refugee band had become a fighting force of significant size. Now if she could just get them to her brother in time. The army continued to maintain a good speed, despite the increased size. Even if she had stayed with the originally planned group of seven, she doubted they could have been more than a few days ahead. It would be worth the delay to deliver an army instead of just a warning, assuming they arrived while there was still a war to fight, of course. Unconsciously, she glanced toward the east toward Alethkar. Worry less about your homeland, Talm said, and more about how you're going to feed all these men. Yasna looked back toward the camp. Some of them had brought their own provisions, but they all obviously expected to be fed for their time. The mercenaries wanted something more substantial than just food, of course, though many of them were desperate enough to accept promises of coin once they reached Alethkar, but before they fought, as long as their stomachs were filled. 
She had hunting groups gathering what they could from the land. But boiled cromlins were only barely palatable, and rock buds were notoriously foul-tasting. The hunting parties occasionally captured a white spine, or on blessed occasions, a wild pig. However, the highlands weren't good for hunting, and the size of her army was too prohibitive to expect it to live off the land completely. That left. There, Yasna said, pointing at the returning Kemnor, who was walking with several scouts. He's announced our presence to the town leaders. We can go to trade now. Talm raised an eyebrow. And how much coin do we have left? He asked. Enough, Yasna said. For a little while, assuming we sell Meridas's fine clothing and jewelry. He had not been happy about that little command and had insisted on keeping at least two outfits and a couple of rings. Still, his contributions, along with some more of their dwindling horse funds, should be enough to keep the army fed for another two weeks, barely long enough to reach Kolinar if there were no more delays. Go get dressed, Yasna said. The city leaders will want to see our herald. Talm's expression darkened. We need to talk, he said, not moving. Later, Yasna promised. Talm sighed, then nodded, going off to put on the fine cloak and shirt she had appropriated for him from Meridas's stock. Despite tailoring, they didn't quite fit, but the rich colors, mixed with Talm's shard blade, made for a passably impressive presentation. The city was only a short distance away. They had camped the army far enough outside its borders to not be too threatening, but close enough that it would be visible from the wall. Since entering the highlands, the landscape had flattened out and villages were more rare. Yet the mines to the north, the prime locations of despotism, made certain that caravans passed this way fairly often. So although the towns were less frequent, they tended to be larger and even more suspicious, if that were possible. Unlike the villages to the south, this city had a wall. The fortification was coated with enough cromstone to make it look almost like a natural growth, and it was topped by a line of suspicious guards. Evening was quickly approaching, and if the impending high storm hadn't darkened the sky, the setting sun would have. It was still possible to make out faces in the dim light, however, and theirs were expressions of rough determination. The message given by soldiers, closed gates, and black walls was clear. This was not a city ruled by an outside tyrant, and nor would it soon be taken. Kemnar led Yasna, Talm, Meridas, Lan, and their honor guard of twenty soldiers to the front gates. Meridas still looked annoyed that he wasn't allowed to ride at the head of the group. Yasna allowed herself a smile. During the last week, the center of power within their force had changed yet again. The newcomers came to see a herald, not an unknown nobleman. Before, she had allowed Meridas to command because he represented the best hope for Alephkar. By the same reasoning, she now required Meridas to let Talm take at least a figurehead role at the fore of the army. Ostensibly, Meridas was still the top nobleman in the group, but everyone knew that deities ranked aristocrats. Where's the herald? One of the wall-top soldiers called down. No one made any moves to open the gates. Talm stepped forward and faced them, holding his shard blade point down at his side. Yasna wished, not for the first time, that she had been able to persuade him to wear Kemnar's shard plate. Standing between Kemnar and Meridas in their plate, even Talm's rich cloth seemed wan. She knew what they were thinking atop that wall. This? This is the supposed Harold Talonel? This soldier with the height and muscles of a normal man? An indistinctive face and simple bearing? Where is the aura of power, the glowing eyes, the towering height, and booming voice? 
Why have you come to Galavan? The guard called down. My man has explained our desires already, Taln yelled back. Open your gates so we may trade with your merchants. There was a pause. Finally, the man called down again. We've changed our minds, he said. We don't want your trade, nor do we need you stealing our soldiers when we have few enough to defend ourselves. Be on your way, false herald. We've seen your kind often enough. A second later, the man continued, as if in afterthought. And don't think to threaten the siege of our city. We've counted your numbers. Eight hundred troops can hardly think to threaten a walled city, especially when those troops are as poorly equipped as yours. Beside her, Meridas's expression darkened, as if an insult against the troops was also one against him. Yasna just sighed to herself. It wasn't the first city they'd been turned away from. For every person who seemed willing to accept Talm's claims, there were the more rational thousand who saw through him. Apparently, the tempestuous Remak countryside was no stranger to men claiming heraldship as a means of gathering fame and troops. She turned to go. Taln remained where he was. Choose from among yourselves your five greatest warriors he called up to them, and send them down here. We already told you, the wall-top man said. You will find no recruits here. No recruiting, Tom said, jamming his shard blade into a nearby boulder. Just a challenge. I will fight them all at once, and do so without a weapon. If they defeat me, you may have my blade. Yasna raised an eyebrow. This part was not expected. Apparently, Tom had decided to improvise. The guard laughed. You expect me to trust your word? How often does a town like yours get an opportunity to win itself a shard blade? Tom called back. Even if that opportunity is dubious. This brought pause. Finally, after some debate from those on top, a rope ladder was thrown over the side of the wall, and five spear-wielding men descended and approached Tom, suspicious of a trap. Within thirty heartbeats, all five lay on the ground, groaning to themselves. The guards atop the wall were silent. Tom whipped his blade from its boulder sheath and pointed it at the guards. You think I need an army to take your city? he demanded in a loud voice. Stone and wood are no obstacle to a blade, and I have two other shard bearers at my command. You think we couldn't brush past your fortifications like a storm through a paper glyph ward? You think we three alone couldn't slaughter your entire defensive force? I come not for my good, but for yours. Death comes one year from the day of my return. Barely six months remain. Forbid me or accept me, I care not, but know this. You are warned. Silence. Then finally, the gates clunked and crept open. Yasna shot a triumphant, self-congratulatory smile at Meridas. The nobleman had watched Tom's exchange with eager eyes, hoping, she knew, that the madman would overextend himself and fall with a spearhead in his gut. Now, Meridas suffered her subtle mockery with dignity. He had complained against Yasna's insistence that their force become the herald's army, but he had not disobeyed her. He knew a good opportunity when he saw one. Despite his deceptively mundane appearance, Tan had a momentum about him. Where he strode, rumors sprouted, and where he fought, respect was gained. The city only had one inn, and it was here that Yasna implemented the second part of her well-tested plan. She put Tom on display. She gained him a conference with the city leaders, a group of three merchants who controlled the water in the summer 
the shelter during storms, and the walls at all times. She made certain that Tom's discussion with them happened in the common room with open storm shutters and plenty of curious ears. Tom explained his purpose, telling them of the return and the other nonsense his mind had contrived. However, since he absolutely believed what he said, his words carried weight, despite their ridiculous nature. That honesty, mixed with the display at the gates, was sure to make Galavan one of their more successful city visits. Yasna smiled to herself as she tallied up expected recruits. Smaller cities than this had yielded ten sets of men. They could probably expect a good fifty soldiers from Galavan itself, and the rumors its people spread would bring even more from outlying communities. She must have appeared too gleeful, for once the conference was finished, the merchants returning to their homes for the night, Talne sought her out to have his talk. He came to her room, one of three gifted by the innkeeper to his prestigious guests, completely unconcerned with etiquette or decency. He barely even paused to knock before he entered. Yasna yelped quietly as he opened the door, jumping up to throw a cloak over her nightgown. Talon shut the door behind him, his face distracted. Only then did he notice Yasna's disheveled blush, and he paused, hand still on the doorknob. Have you no sense of propriety? she demanded, flustered as she seated herself back on the stool beside her dressing mirror, pulling her cloak closed at the top to hide the exposed flesh beneath. Bursting into a woman's rooms at night, far past modest hours? Tom stood for a moment, as if stunned by something completely unexpected. Then he blushed deeply and looked away. I apologize, he said. It has been a very long time since I have had to consider such things. Yasna snorted. For an immortal deity, you certainly can be remarkably dense sometimes, Tom. He smiled wanly, but didn't make any moves to leave, so she settled herself on the stool as if she were in her audience chamber back in the palace. Behind her, the room's storm shutters rattled from wind and rain. The high storm had finally hit. Back in the camp, the regular men were about to spend a very damp evening. If you don't consider such things, Yasna noted, then I assume this is not a social call. Tal nodded, not bothering to take a seat. You're using me, he said. I don't like it. Characteristically blunt. And how exactly is it that I'm using you? she asked. Talm raised an eyebrow. Don't play at your games, Yasna. I've noticed how Meridas holds back and lets me speak. I realize how you place me at the forefront when we visit these towns. How you encourage me to speak of my purpose and my mission. I know how you send newcomers to gawk at me during training. How you encourage visitors and townspeople to spread the word of the Herald's army. And? Yasna asked. You have a problem with these things? I thought you wanted to warn the land of its danger. Are you not pleased with the attention you are receiving and the control you have been granted? By Kevahin, Yasna, Tom snapped. This land isn't your court to be flirted and manipulated. We're not dealing with balls and squabblings over ranks. These are people, Yasna, not political prizes. Good people who've lived hard lives, and now you're enlisting them to march to their deaths. You don't care about my cause. You still think I'm insane. You just want an army you can bring back to show off to your traitorous king of a brother. Yasna stiffened at the attack. I don't see what it matters to you, she said coldly. You get what you desire, a population warned of the return. I get what I need. Soldiers to aid my homeland in its defense. Where is the argument? Tom leaned down, looking her in the eyes. One thing politicians never seem to understand. 
is that intention matters. It matters to these people. It matters to the Almighty. And it matters to me. I will not gather this army under false pretenses. Better they remain here, warned, than they come with me and die in Alethkar, leaving their families undefended. He stood, his expression dark. I will not be your puppet any longer. I had hoped we could discuss this, but I should have realized better. You and I can never discuss anything. He turned, reaching for the doorknob. I'll take you to the holy city, Yasna said. Talm froze. Outside, the tempestuous high storm raged, but in her room, there was only silence. We'll go there, Yasna said. The entire army, despite the diversion and the wasted time, will go, just like you want. No broken oaths, no abandoned soldiers. Tom stood, hand gripping the knob. Finally, he turned. Must everything be a deal to you, woman? Yes, Yasna said quietly. Tom stood, staring at her with dark eyes. Oh, sit down, Tom, she said with exasperation. I can barely think with you looming over me like that. He sighed, letting go of the knob. He didn't bother to find a stool. He simply settled himself on the ground, leaning with his back against the door. It's a good offer, Tom, she said. If your brethren are actually there, gathered in Joravan, as you claim, then we can deliver them an army trained and ready. These last few months won't have been wasted at all. If they aren't there, then you'll have to reassess your goals. You can hardly face the storm shades without an army or a center of operations. But with Alethkar stable and free of invaders, and with my promises of aid, you can go about your preparations without further hindrance. Either way, you are better off than if you decided to leave us now and start over in another kingdom. Tom sighed again. He sat for a moment, as if listening to the rain strike stone outside. Finally, he spoke. Why is it so hard for you to believe that I am who I say that I am? Because I've seen proof to the contrary, Yasna said. The sign refusing to work. You have flawless, if accented, use of the Aleth tongue, despite a supposed thousand years in absentia. You display an inability to give any display of power, divine or otherwise. Tom shook his head. Those aren't your reasons, Yasna. You may see them as validations, but they aren't the core of your doubt. Oh? Yasna asked. And what is? Your disbelief in the Almighty. Tom replied simply. Yasna paused. She hadn't expected him to be right. I'll admit, she said, that my skepticism of his existence doesn't exactly encourage me to believe in his divine servants. What happened? Tom asked. What happened that could make you so determined not to believe? Why do people always ask that? Yasna demanded. They act as if there were some catastrophic event in my life that made me reject God, as if I were turning my back on a distasteful bowl of soup. It's not like that, Tom. Nothing happened to me. Why do the other people believe in the Almighty, other than that they've been taught to do so since they were children? What happened to them? Surely there must be reasons, Tom said. There are, Yasna said, but it's the entire concept, not just one or two facts, not just a bad experience that disturbs me about Voronism. The idea that morality is based on some external, all-powerful being makes me uncomfortable. The monks teach that all goodness comes from the Almighty. One of them actually told me that without the Almighty, there is no reason for goodness in men for the dwelling and eternal consequences, provide the only equalizing pressure upon the souls of men. Don't you see how insulting that is? 
They imply that there can be no inherent good in people, that we depend on fear of retribution to keep us doing what's right. To them, anyone who doesn't agree to their moral superiority is damned. I see, Tom said quietly. The Almighty provides an escape, Yasna continued, a means of avoiding responsibility. If we do what he supposedly wants, then we don't really have to worry about learning right and wrong for ourselves. By contriving for ourselves an external source of truth, we're left to be carnal and wrong as long as we're striving to remake ourselves, as the arguments teach. It also allows the monks to have an absolute monopoly on morality. They get to decide what is good and what isn't, since they speak for the Almighty. The rest of us have inferior, even defective souls that are in need of their repair. I see, Tom repeated thoughtfully. Yasna sat defiantly, preparing her counter-arguments. He would find that no matter what holes he tried to poke, she had plugs, long formulated. She'd had countless discussions with Ralmacha and other theologians, and none of them had been able to give any solid defense to her attacks on their religion. It must be hard to live. Not believing in anything, Tom said. Yasna raised an eyebrow at the unexpected path. I don't find it so hard. Don't you? Tom asked, sounding genuinely inquisitive. Your brother betrayed you. The other members of your family are all dead, and you have no god to rely on. What is there left for you? The words hurt more than she would ever give him the satisfaction of admitting. I have Alice Carr, she finally replied, and I will do anything to protect it, Tom. I'll use these people. I'll even exploit you. My kingdom is all I have left. Intentions, Tom mumbled. That one at least has some merit. He sighed. We will go to the holy city, and I will continue your charade. But assuming you are right, and these people end up fighting for Alethkar, you will care for them. Give them homes inside your kingdom, and send for their families to join them. You will give them a better life than these harsh lands. Of course, Yasna answered honestly. Talon rose. Behind her, the winds had grown still. The high storm had passed. Talon nodded once, looking oddly tired then left. She walked to the door, watching his back as he traipsed down the stone hallway to the room he would share with Kemnar. There was nobility in belief, even delusional belief. That much she could admit, even admire, though she would never have it herself. Enjoy your tryst? Yasna jumped in startlement. Merida stood in the shadowed corridor that led to the common room, watching her unseen. He stepped into the light, glancing after Tom, smiling, no, leering slightly. Tell me, Lady Colin, what is it like, betting a god? You insult my honor, she hissed. Oh, come now, Merida said. You make such claims standing there, your cloak half open, your undergown more flimsy than the wind, your hair must from your lovemaking. The entire camp knows how you look at him and he at you. It must be terribly inconvenient not having any tents in which to plan your diversions. Yasna pulled her cloak tight, realizing just how much she was revealing, and blushed. She tried to think of a response. What did he mean, how you look at him? She did nothing of the sort. Unfortunately, she realized how things must appear at the moment. We are people of understanding, Yasna, Merida said, strolling forward. I care not what you do. I only care for the political union. But do try to keep your relations with our dear Harold a bit more subtle. 
For the sake of propriety, I will have to claim you were a virgin on our wedding night. Yasna thinned her eyes. He claimed he didn't care, but she could tell that he was lying. He was jealous. Very jealous. She could see the anger flash in his eyes when he mentioned Tom, a seething hatred that she finally understood. He assumed she was seeing Tom behind his back and had assumed it for some time. Meridas was usually so good at hiding his emotions, but she could sense his jealousy even through his uncaring facade. And for some reason, despite what she thought of Meridas, knowing of his jealousy made her feel a little bit more confident. He dispelled that emotion quickly. Do not forget that you are mine, he said in a low voice. For now, I allow your playing. But when the time comes, when our union is sealed, I will allow no further dalliances. Do not embarrass me, Yasna. He was not jealous because he cared for her. He was jealous because he saw another man possessing something that belonged to him. You disgust me, she whispered. This made him smile. If you'll excuse me, my lady, I have business to be about. Apparently, this town has a proper brothel. I do hope the ladies there are more satisfactory than the tavern whores available in the other villages. Don't worry yourself about gossip. Some of us know how to be discreet. He turned, ducking into his room, then emerged a moment later and strode down the hallway, obviously enjoying her hateful look. He didn't get far, however, before he was practically shoved aside by a worried Kemnar. Kemnar ignored Meridas's look of indignation, instead rushing to Yasna's door. My lady, he said urgently, we need to get out of this city, now. They're about two days' march away, my lords and lady, the Galavan soldier explained. They made a deal with the lords of our city. I carried the messages myself. We're supposed to keep you in the city for two days until they can get their forces here to attack you. Tom looked nonplussed, despite the haste of their preparations for departure. Kemnar had organized the honor guard, and it waited nervously in the street as Yasna and the others left the building. The night air was damp and cool from the high storm, and the stones were still slick. The soldier who spoke was a short, nervous man who bore the beginnings of a bruised face. Natchin was one of the five who had fought Taln at the city gates. He scuttled beside them, speaking in a low voice. You have to get out before the lords know you're alerted, he said. If you can escape the city, I doubt they'll pursue. If what you say is true, Taln asked as they joined the honor guard outside the inn. Why did the guards turn us away at the gates? The city lords didn't want to appear too eager to let you in, he said. They knew you had camped for the night and planned to send word to you later. And why are you telling me these things? Tom asked pointedly. Natchen looked ashamed. I'm not right sure, my lord, he admitted. But, well, I fancy myself one of the best fighters I've ever known. I win eight out of ten bouts against serious opponents. I've rarely been beaten as soundly as when I fought you today, and with four others. Well, my lord, if you're not a herald, then you're certainly like no other man I've crossed spears with. Besides, what the city lords do just isn't right, and I'll never see any of the coin they get for it. Tall nodded. You believe him? Meridas asked quietly. Not with the voice of a challenge, but the voice of one who took threats seriously. Tom paused. Dare we not? he asked. Agreed, Meridas said, waving for the honor guard to escort them out of the city. You'll have to go with us, Tom said to Natchin. Do you have family in the village? They will be in danger. Natchin paled. 
He might have been a fine warrior as he claimed, but he seemed very new to intrigue. You've been seen with us by the innkeeper and anyone passing on the street, Town said. They'll know who spoiled their deal. Kemnar, take four men and go get his family. Go quickly. We'll wait for you by the gates. Kemnar nodded, waving for a squad and taking Natchin by the shoulder. The rest of their group made for the city gates, where a group of apprehensive guardsmen barred their exit. Um, we can't let anyone out after dark, my lord, the gate leader said, waving for one of his men to dash off in the direction of the city palace. It's against city law, Tom nodded. Send a messenger to the city lords if you would, he said in a civil voice. We have just had word of an emergency back at our camp. We need to return immediately. The captain nodded then, a bit uncertain. He waved for a second man to follow the first, obviously just keeping up pretenses. Will they attack? Yasna asked with worry as Taln rejoined their group. He glanced back at the gate guards. There were perhaps a couple ten sets of them. Not enough to face the honor guard and two shard bearers, but perhaps enough to hold the gatehouses until help arrived. That depends on whether or not they have orders to kill us, Tom said. The invaders might want you and Meridas alive. Thankfully, Kemnor arrived before the messengers returned. He towed a worried-looking woman and three children along with the soldier, Natchin. As soon as Tom saw them, he turned to the gate. Without warning or preamble, he whipped out his blade and launched himself at the wood. Three swings flashed in the darkness. Then Tom kicked a door-shaped rectangular chunk of wood free from the gate. It thunked down against the stones outside. Through, Tom ordered, as the gate guards cried out in alarm. Kemnor took position on the other side of their group, holding out his blade threateningly as several soldiers approached. Yasna ducked through the opening in the gate. Outside, she could see movement on the walls. Tan was right. Their escape depended a great deal upon whether or not the townspeople had been given orders to kill. A squad of archers atop the walls would have little trouble picking them off as they escaped. No arrows fell, though Tan walked at the back of the group nervously. Blade held at the ready as if to swipe the missiles from the air. Either the city lords didn't respond in time, or they feared Tom's retribution, for no pursuit was given. Yasna didn't relax until they reached camp, however, a few minutes later. Break down the camp, Tom commanded. We leave tonight, you, he pointed at Natchin. Come with me. He led the man to Yasna's canopy, where Kemnar prepared their makeshift map of Remak, drawn from memory by Tan and Kemnar, with help from some of the local mercenaries. Where are they camped? Tan asked Natchin. Here, my lord, the man said, pointing at a place on the map not far from the city. Or that's where they were when I spoke with them. That was only yesterday. They seemed very rushed to try and catch up with you. They sent riders ahead to the city, but my masters wanted confirmation of their size and your size before choosing sides. I was the one who scouted you both out. How many? Tan asked. Looked like about a thousand, Natchin said. Mostly on foot, only about ten riders. Most of the riders were noblemen, though, and only half of them carried swords. Five shard bearers, Meridas cursed, and an entire ten squad of infantry. They want to capture us badly indeed. They must have managed to keep their capture of Ral Aram a secret, Tom said, and fear will bring troops to warn or to flank. They're traveling quickly, my lord, Natchin said. No wagons at all. How do they eat? Yasna asked. Natchin shrugged. I only know what I see. They didn't even carry sleeping tents. Outside the canopy, 
Soldiers and people were rousing, and shouts were called as camp was broken down. Yasna understood Tom's consternation. Their own army was ragged, under-equipped, and was accompanied by an increasingly large group of civilians. They could never hope to outrun the larger force, and they certainly couldn't fight it. They would be slaughtered. The city? Yasna asked. Will never let us in now that we've fled, Tom said. The guards were right, no matter what I claimed. We'd have trouble capturing it, even with three blades. Even if we did, the Vaden force has more shard bearers than we. If we can get through the fortifications, then they will have even less trouble following. Well, we can't stand here, Meridas said angrily. We may need to take the lady and escape quickly. And leave everyone else to die? Yasna asked, horrified. They'll leave the army alone, if you're not with it, Meridas said unconvincingly. Yasna regarded him with a flat expression. These soldiers belong to the same force that tried to massacre everyone in the palace just to keep word of the attack from escaping. They won't leave a force of 800 troops at their back. She's right, Tom said. The group fell silent. The map ruffled slightly in Tom's grip, wind blowing through the camp, carrying the sounds of frightened men, many still new to war barely trained and inexperienced. Yasna breathed in the wet air, trying to think in the darkness. Meridas, I'll need my blade back, Tom said, taking out his own weapon and jabbing it into the ground, then knocking the opal free. You can have it back if I return. That won't be necessary, Meridas said, summoning his own blade. The implication in his voice was blatant. It wouldn't be necessary because Tarn wouldn't be returning. What? Yasna asked as they exchanged weapons. Cut east, Tarn said, still speaking to Meridas. The lady has agreed to travel to the holy city and you might as well start now. Perhaps it will throw them off. Even if it doesn't, there are ruins there. They could provide a defensible position. Meridas nodded, affixing his old opal to the new blade. The claw grips on the pommel immediately bent back into place, grabbing hold of the new stone, and the metal flowed like liquid, changing into his straight-backed shorter blade. Tom? Yasna demanded of him. What are you thinking? Tom nodded farewell to Kemnar, to Meridas, and finally to her. Then he turned hefting the shard blade onto his shoulder and began walking into the night. Yasna dashed over, grabbing him by the arm. Tom, this is foolishness, she snapped. One man cannot face a thousand men, even if that man is you. One man can slow them, he said. If he attacks at night and in storms, killing lone men. His eyes were grim. He intended more. He intended something very foolish. He was a madman, with no understanding of his own limitations. Tom, I think, before you say those words, Yasna, he warned, before you forbid me, think about what you said earlier. You told me that only Alethkar mattered, that you would use me to your ends if it would save your homeland. Even if I buy you only a short amount of time, would it not be worth the chance you might find better ground for defense? Or even reach the holy city and find a way through its oath gate? Slim hopes, she whispered. But less slim if I go, he said. You either let me go, or you send back a couple hundred troops to stand and die as a delaying move. You can either sacrifice two hundred men or you can sacrifice just one. What will you decide, Yasna Kolin? She who loves Alethkar? Yasna stood in the cold night, then slowly let her hand slip from his arm. Tal nodded, then continued walking. 
She watched him disappear into the darkness, then stood there until Meridas came to get her. The self-satisfied smile in the man's eyes sickened her even more than her own guilt. Kemnar, she said, looking around. As usual, he stood only a short distance away, waiting quietly, almost unnoticed, upon her needs. Go after him, she said. Watch him and see what he does. Try and keep him from killing himself. I need, we need him to hold this army together. Assuming it lasts long enough to matter. Kemnar stood for a moment, then nodded in the darkness, face illuminated by one of their few lanterns. He turned, waving to Vinda, second in command of Yasna's guards. Yasna watched with confusion as Kemnar pulled out his shard blade, then knocked the opal free. What are you doing? Yasna asked. Kemnar handed the blade to Vinda. You're probably going to need that here, he said, then moved to quickly gather some supplies. Vinda watched Kemnar go, holding the shard blade with awed fingers. Kemnar, Yasna said with alarm. You are not allowed to get yourself killed. Do you understand? Watch over him, but don't endanger yourself. Kemnar slung a water bag over his back. I don't intend to, he said but I also don't know that I'll be back in time to help defend you. Don't worry. I fully expect to reclaim that blade. Vinda, don't get too attached to it. Vinda smiled a toothy grin, gripping the sword with a firm hand. It'll be waiting for you, he promised, even if I have to wet it on a bit of Vaden blood. Kemnar nodded to him, bowed to Yasna, and jogged off into the night obviously intent on catching up with Tom. Meridas's smile only deepened as he watched Kemnar's retreating figure, and Yasna was forced to confront what she'd just done. Without Tom, or even Kemnar, to counteract Meridas. Meridas turned to the camp, barking orders without reservation now that Tom was gone. The herald's army would have to do without its herald, for a time.